Oi, are you done yet? Uh, One second. Well, hurry. He's impatient. Okay, okay, all right, okay, okay. Uh, here it is. Here it is. Oh, that's perfect. It's not every day you turn 500. My best work yet. Hello, Acolytes! Welcome to the Cleric Corner. My name is Riker, and here we talk about all things Dungeons & Dragons, tapping into our higher powers to create worlds more unique and stories more impactful. According to the Player's Handbook, artificers are incredible inventors that seek to improve lives or topple governments. They seek to fix the unfixable by combining science and magic. But if you've been around the channel for a while, you know that we're going to take those archetypes subvert it and create some new ways that you can play your artificer. Because what if your artificer was just a lowly cobbler or powered their machines with souls? And just to warn you, I will be pronouncing artificer in multiple different ways during this video, not because I think one is right, but because that's just how my brain works. But I'll be going over 10 artificer concepts to help get the gears turning and with a little magical tinkering, create a character you'll love. Make sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss future videos. First up, let's look at an artificer who is not an inventor themselves, but taking advantage of items that they found that came from ancient times. The ancient tech artificer in this case has compiled items that they've dug up from archeological sites, or they were just a regular commoner who on a fateful day fell down a well and found them there. Lost through the ages, it is slow going for this artificer to figure out how these items work. These items being from cultures that are thousands of years old, or cultures that are thousands of light years away. With alien tech in this case, it would be a good excuse to bring in a lithid or slad into your campaign. Perhaps they are returning to claim what's always been theirs. But just as well, this future tech could be from a time traveler who left it behind, or even a modern scientist who died before they could bless the world with their invention. Give your artificer enough time and they too can figure out how to make their own items with this technology. But instead of these technologies coming from some alien species, Perhaps they're the technology of the gods themselves. The Revelator Artificer was specifically chosen by the gods to further their purposes, using you to further develop the world's technologies and push it into the next age. But these revelations could also come from darker forces, who wish not to cultivate the world, but to drive it into chaos. A great example of the Revelator archetype would be Percy, from Critical Role's Vox Machina. Driven by revenge, this dark force gave him the ability and the know-how to create a gun in a medieval world. But of course, as we know, the being had ulterior motives themselves. But knowing that these gods can be all-knowing, omniscient, and not beholden to the bonds of time, this artificer is granted a small portion of the knowledge that the gods have. This might even change your artificer's magic origin to be more divine instead of arcane. But then we have to ask ourselves, what if the magic instead came from nature? The Naturecraft Artificer uses rock, stone, sticks, and leaves to imbue their Artificer magic into. They are your Boy Scouts who know how to work the land to their benefit. They carve runes into a hollow tree stump to make an Elder's Cannon, or make a magical armor out of animal skins. These skins and armor they use could come from monsters and aberrations instead of beasts, cashing in on the spoils that the party ranger kills for them. They find that using organic matter in their magic is way more potent than metal. They could even store magical elements in natural gemstones that they find, and when placed in the DIY contraptions that they make, imbue magical abilities. But what if the magic imbued into these crystals are not magic, but the essence of creatures themselves? The Soul Trapper Artificer has a darker way of imbuing their magic into items. They understand that in a world of magic, science and progression comes at a price. So they either capture these essences and souls as they're adventuring, or steal them covertly from the populace as necessary. These items then become your regular sentient items. In a world of D&D, perhaps you come across a sentient sword with an ancient warrior imbued inside. Somehow, some way, possibly an artificer put it there. An unfortunate side effect if the soul is very annoying, but could act as a guide and help to a warrior in the future. But now let's not forget that morality is a spectrum. While the peaceful artificers use arcana and the more ambitious artificers use souls, 
We look at an artificer who just combines both body and item to meet in the middle. A Vivimancer artificer splices and graphs parts of individuals to become amalgamations or cyborgs. They stitch displacer beast tentacles to your back to give you increased AC, or give you a marsupial pouch of holding, or they replace your eye with some mechanical orb, or put a flamethrower inside of your arm. These are your best kinds of experimental surgeons. They could even replace your inner organs with that of other creatures possibly being some sort of grave robber, where they dig up the body, take the lung out to enchant it with, let's say, water breathing, and then do surgery to now give you this lung. If you've ever read the book or seen the TV series Shadow and Bone, they do use parts of monsters and beasts as amplifiers to their magic. The bones of antlers in this case melding with the collarbones of the main character, making her magic more powerful. But speaking of modifications, there's a lot of other things that you can do that are more generally accepted by society. In this case, we're talking more beauty and aesthetics. The modifier artificer at ground level can use use magical tattoos to imbue magical effects. For those less permanent, you can use henna or body paints for those more artistic artificers. For the more permanent, they apply piercings for more magical jewelry, or do plastic surgery to give you higher cheekbones or horns on your head. These may even give you disguised self or charming benefits. Or this artificer could be a fashion designer where they can go Edna mode and stitch runes into the fabric for their best pieces. Hats, gloves, masks, you name it. There's a ton that you can do in the beauty industries. If you like what I do here and think this video adds value to you, Consider supporting me on Patreon. One of my goals on this channel is to create a space where creators can truly expand on their ideas and cultivate creativity, especially in a world that's a little more judgmental and a little less cultivating. So if that resonates with you, the link will be in the description. But getting back to it, let's say that your artificer is the quick on their feet type. They rarely prepare, but are very confident in their ability to get out of any situation. The scrapper artificer sees the treasure in the trash and knows exactly the full potential of any mundane item. They are your MacGyver character where the only things that they need to open a safe is a paperclip and bubblegum. They can make a bomb with just the materials that they find in a tavern, or they can make a flashlight with just a potato and a lemon. The flashes of genius is a common trait with these artificers, but other artificers still rely on dependable skills and tools that are readily on hand. Practice in their craft and good at it too, the tradesman artificers are your professionals in the tool trades. Cobblers, bakers, leather workers, blacksmith, jewelers, and cartographers. But they're not your average players in the game, no, no. They are magical artisans that imbue their mundane items with magic. The cobbler specializes in magical footwear and the baker specializes in magical edibles. Along with the craft, you can also focus hard on the tools that you use as your magical foci. Xanathar's Guide to Everything goes into full detail of all the multiple things that you can do with each of these tool sets. You should also be able to use them in fun and unique ways. Perhaps all of these craftsmen are a part of some sort of secret organization of tradesmen. Oh, but speaking of secret organizations, your artificer could be a secret agent, a part of some government program. With the spy artificer, you get to play a little James Bond using your gadgets and whirly gigs to accomplish missions. You could play the James Bond-esque character yourself, or be more like Q from the series, or the Quartermaster, who in the movies was the one who provided all of their agents with their gadgetry. These missions could be stealth or straight bombs and sabotage. This could also be your Inspector Gadget, where you're arguably part Warforged, but always having the right tool hidden somewhere in your person. Or your Batman or Iron Man, where all you need to make these fancy gadgets is money. But some prefer the simpler life and focus on the enjoyment of children and in the little things. The toy maker artificer imbues their magical items with love and creativity, giving a teddy bear that has warding capabilities or a toy soldier that can act as a familiar. You could still get maniacal like the DC villain, the toy maker, but for this example, we're gonna go pacifist. They just try their best to improve the world around them in small and simple ways. They know that as long as they help people smile, that their purpose is fulfilled. Perhaps this artificer is a child and their unbridled emotions and desires desires are the things that imbue these items with their magic. Giving your paladin their favorite toy because it helped them not be afraid, and thus giving your paladin resistance to fear. As far as this child is concerned, all they want to do is help. But with all of these...
Hello Acolytes, welcome to the Cleric Corner. My name is Riker and here we talk about all things Dungeons and Dragons, tapping into our higher powers to create worlds more unique and stories more impactful. Now I'm sorry for all of those ears that I just blew out screaming, but today we're going to talk about barbarians. According to the player's handbook, barbarians are tribal ferocities that hate civilization and channel a primal rage in their fighting. However, we'll be subverting that trope and finding new and unique ways to flavor your barbarian. What if your rage didn't come from anger or your endurance came from a lineage of giants? And these ideas are just mine, so take what you like and leave the rest. I'll be going over 10 barbarian concepts, and my only hope is that you will be just as reckless with your imagination. But let's address raging first, as it is the arguably most well-known feature of the barbarian and what makes it the class. Lots of people see it as a primal anger, but what if it were other emotions? The passion barbarian is strengthened in a fight through other motives. Instead of raging, a barbarian could get giddy, hyping up his own attacks with his excitement. Another could be fear, where you're striking out desperately in panic with a timid character. It could even be love, where your attacks are boistered because of the confidence that you have with your party members. I have a personal headcanon that Yasha from Critical Role was this kind of barbarian. And you still have emotions like sadness, anxiety, or even hangry. Or it could be serenity, stepping into a meditative type of rage. But what if instead of rage, it was more of a craze or a charm, where your mind becomes not your own and you fall into a trance. The disassociated barbarian deals with alternate personalities or mind control. They become very unaware of who they are and what they do when they rage, even suffering memory loss afterwards. Great examples of this would be Green Goblin, the Hulk, or the Winter Soldier. Even a party member could be the one that puts this barbarian in a rage, repeating a series of words. These keywords could be 17, Daybreak, or Fright Car. It could also activate in response to rabidity, adrenaline, or PTSD. In an extreme case, they might even have an out-of-body experience where they're watching their body pummel enemies as they're looking on from above. But this disassociation could come from other sources as well. It could be a possession of some demon or spirit that could be symbiotic or parasitic. This barbarian I like to call the Legion. They have a little devil in their ear that's whispering them to rage and do things that they might not really want to do. Or like the Bible story, the Legion could have a menagerie of spirits inside of them that, that act out in rage through unfinished business. But these spirits don't always have to be vengeful. Perhaps you are possessed by some sort of draconic spirit that allows you to borrow its strength and endurance. I don't know why, but Power Rangers come to mind when activating some sort of this spirit totem. But these spirits that share your vessel might be sentient and might have an attitude. But speaking of ethereal, your natural ability to endure hits and stay in the fight might come from more of an undead source. You are on your second life with the reclaimed barbarian, a reborn fighter with a type of undead resilience that keeps you from dying again. You might be an empty vessel without a soul or be affected with some sort of lichdom or slowly wasting away as your body clings to an unlife. Or you could be channeling the ethereal realm and actually go a little ghost-like when you rage. And this would explain the half damage that you would be taking. You might not be walking through walls like Danny Phantom, but just enough to keep what you have left anchored to the material realm. Your rage doesn't come from being angry, but by accepting your undead nature. But channeling death can be just as effective as channeling life. In this case, we'll look at blood magic, and in a lot of ways not dissimilar to the Blood Hunter by Matthew Mercer, where they use self-harm in their fighting styles. The Bloodletter Barbarian does this to empower their strikes. If you've seen the anime Attack on Titans, a lot of characters would use a form of self-harm in order to activate their transformation. Now, 
Now, be sensitive, of course, with self-harm at your table, but this blood magic could both empower your strikes and harden your skin. Your reckless attack or brutal criticals could be blood brands that you put on the enemy as you strike them, and your blood boils within you as it strengthens your muscles. Now, interesting things about the historical barbarian in the real world, blood was already a large part of how these berserkers would activate their rage at least in theory. They would consume the blood of animals and it believed that they would grant them their strength. So with the blood drinker barbarian, we get to explore that. But not just blood, but other consumables as well. Some of you might be familiar with the character Popeye. You could be a vegetarian barbarian as you consume spinach to get random spurts of strength. Some other consumables would of course be any type of alcohol or drug or Whey protein. In the TV show Arcane, the shimmer drug was a great consumable that activated a magical infection type of rage. And am I mad that this is the third time I've referenced this TV show in these Better Class series? No. Not at all. Another historical fact about the Barbarian is that they used to use a mushroom called Amanita muscaria, which is a drug that allegedly made other things look really small. And this was actually the inspiration behind the Mario mushroom. The more you know. Origins and history of classes outside D&D is actually really fun to explore and could provide a lot of inspiration for characters. If you guys would like to see some videos about exploring some of these archetypes through history and the things that made them who they are, let me know in the comments below. For the next archetype, let's say your sturdiness and strengths come from some sort of unique lineage. And much like the Draconic Sorcerer might get Draconic Magic from their Draconic lineage, even though they might not be Dragonborn, the Giant Barbarian gets their magical lineage from, you guessed it, Giants. Their resilience comes from Hill Giants, Ogres, Trolls, Cyclopses, or other Giants, even though they might not be of the Goliath or Furbolg races. The war between Dragons and giants continue through their magical descendants. Another unique lineage that could explain your tough skin would be Earth Ganassi, or raging could be your skin hardening to brace for attacks. Or you could even be a type of magnet that repels metal weapons when they strike. But play around with your lineage and see if you could find inborn strength from other things. But on the topic of metal and magnets, you could flavor your rages as putting on or donning a mechanical type of armor. And yes, I know that the Barbarian doesn't really wear armor, but this would be reskinning and reflavoring a mechanic and would have no impact on your AC. But the Mech Barbarian would be kind of like activating the Nano Suit from Iron Man. Or again, if that's too futuristic for your campaign, you could also use tattoos that activate on your rage. I think the Barrier Tattoo magic item from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything fits this narrative very well. But if we lean on the magical aspect a little bit more, we'll find a Barbarian that I particularly enjoy. Through enchantment or magical ability, this barbarian absorbs and assimilates the elements around them. For all those Marvel fans out there, the absorbing man uses these elements to strengthen their body. When they get into a fight, your barbarian could reach into their pocket and touch a coin, making their skin turn gold. And they can do this, of course, only as many times as their rage slots allow. But this would be what the spells Stone Skin or Bark Skin would look like. You could even use these spells to reflavor the rage, even having spell scrolls that you activate each time you do so. But absorbing elements and making your skin something else is just so cool. And now one thing that sometimes we tend to forget is just how charismatic barbarians can be. Now, usually this has to do with intimidation, but what if it's more of a magical charisma? You get to cause a level of uncertainty in the attacks of your enemies with the Charmer Barbarian. You put an aura of charisma around you that attracts your enemies to you but turning this charm against them, making their attacks less powerful. So your rage is less about buffing yourself and more about debuffing others. This of course leaving them vulnerable for things like reckless attack. Now this isn't a heavy charm or the charm spell, but just enough to flavor your barbarian in a way that wasn't there really before. But these are your regular bardbarians where no one really wants to mess up that pretty face. It's the himbo character that you didn't know you needed. But it's incredible that there is so much that you can do with the Barbarian class. And whether you play it like the Tribal Hermit as it outlines in the player's handbook or one of these ideas, the point is you're having fun. And if you're a DM, whatever brings out the joy in your players as you create your NPCs. And if you guys had any other Barbarian ideas that either you've played or created, let me know in the comments below. I'd love to hear about them. Next week.
According to the player's handbook, the bard is masters of song, speech, and the magic they contain. Bards say that the multiverse was spoken into existence, and that the words of gods give it shape, and that the echoes of the primordial words of creation still echo through the cosmos. But what if your bard didn't get their magic from music, and instead got them from some other source? What would that even look like? How would you flavor your bard to make something unique and different? When is a bard not a bard? Let's talk about it and give you bardic inspiration for your next character build. Welcome to the Cleric Corner. My name is Riker, and here we talk about all things Dungeons & Dragons, tapping into our higher powers to create worlds that are more unique and stories that are more impactful. If you're one of the many players who don't quite feel comfortable playing an instrument at the table or making up rhymes or seeing Disney's I'll make a man out of you in the middle of combat, but you still like the idea of playing a bard, you're not alone. I'll be going over 10 ways to reflavor your bard and make your character more unique and perhaps fit your playstyle a little bit better. Because contrary to popular meme culture, they're not the horny creatures that we sometimes make them out to be. At least not always. However, with bards still being the charisma masters that they are, let's look at the first bard the extrovert. It is said that extroverts get energy from being around people, so why not your bard get magic from other people as well? They might be your average party thrower or fraternity or socialite that just being around people brings them joy. The extrovert pulls magic from the essence of community and interaction. Your charisma could focus on bringing others together, creating social groups, or being your kingdom's event planner. This could also mean that if your bard is ever alone for a long period of time, they might lose out on their magic. But with their magic coming from people and not instruments, it creates a fun role play aspect. But also with being people focused, you could also become popular and create a following for yourself, cultivating some social media fame, if you will. This bard I like to call the Lockhart. And of course, referring to the Harry Potter character that we know and love. And in the movies, sure, he was still a wizard, but his magic and charisma and how people viewed him came solely from his books and the media. In my Better Clerics video, I touched on clerics getting their powers from followers, and why not bards too? And why not a bard that thrives on groupies and stardom? And when the paladin gets their powers from a conviction to their cause, why not a bard get powers from conviction to self? And sure, you can still have this bard play music or sing, but that's not where their magic really comes from. Or you can be a regular Kardashian and have no talent and all the fame. For all the Kardashian fans, that was a joke. I'm sure they have talent somewhere. But let's say that your bard does have talent. And it could be music, but what if it were other hobbies? What if it was sculpting, calligraphy, doll making, painting, cooking, or heck, even making YouTube videos? This bard is called the creator, and they channel their creative energy through their passion projects to create their magic. Or their magic comes from the joy that they have in creating these things. I think a lot of creators want to just spill a little bit more magic into the world. Your sculptures could be your arcane focuses, and you can literally paint spells into the the air, or you can imbue magic into the dolls that you make, much like the artificer does. That actually sounds really scary. <laughs> Now you can still have a following as a creator, but just doing the things that you love is magic enough for you. But if you think this channel as a creator adds value to you, consider hitting that like button and subscribing. See what I did there? I know you're very impressed by my segues, by the way. But it is my passion project, and I hope to do this full time one day. Help me reach a thousand subscribers by Christmas. That's the current goal. One thing I do love about this game, though, is that it keeps the inner child alive. So for the next Bard idea, let's look at the inner child. This bard has retained its natural wonder and childlike curiosity that it manifests their imagination into the world. Flavor-wise, I can actually imagine this being very like Jester from Critical Role. And just by sheer belief, you see the magic in the world, even the weave itself. To this bard, seeing isn't believing, believing is seeing. This could also manifest as wanderlust or being a natural foodie, but just finding joy and color in the monotonous way of life. They tend to be flowing with either positivity or naivety. And if we look back into our childhood in a general sense, I'm sure many of us have enjoyed Disney movies and Disney princesses, all of us being charmed by their magic. So here we look at the Disney princess bard. Specifically, let's look at Snow White, Cinderella, Pocahontas, and Moana. By their loving, passionate, and charismatic personas, they become very in tune with nature and animals. Now this could be close to the druid, but I wanna take this opportunity to say, 
it's okay to sometimes blur the lines between classes. It just creates more flavor opportunities and multi-classing options. And besides, I think there is a reason that the Speak With Animals spell is a druid and a bard spell. And in history, there's actually many cases where bards and druids were one in the same cultural storytellers around a campfire. But if not in tune with nature, just regular princesses really do have a charisma about them. They have much influence in their status and appeal to those that know her. This could be like unto the Lockhart bard, but actually be legit when it comes to their followers. A bard that gets their strength from their royal subjects. And speaking of people with loving personas, what if bards simply get their power from the contents of their heart and firmness of their character? This bard is the heart of gold, running around starting nonprofits, helping the homeless, putting church groups together, and traveling the world providing water to those that don't have it. These bards are the joy to others through their kindness and compassion. These bards could even be shy and run from attention, but their charisma comes from the trust that others have in them. And again, like the paladin, a bard could get their power from their conviction to their cause. But I definitely see a bard more in a soup kitchen than a paladin would be. But with the hearts of gold, there are also broken hearts. Happy turns to melancholic with the broken bard because magic can come just as much from pain as it does from fulfillment. There is much power in the dark side. This bard struggles with their inner turmoil and lashes out magically. If there was a wild magic bard, this would be them. And I think a good example of this would be Wanda from Scarlet Witch, who in the event of the death of her lover, created an alternate reality of sorts where this lover still existed, using her power in a way that she never thought possible. But a broken heart isn't the only trauma. We have PTSD, anxiety, depression, and I'm sure many of you can add to that list. But I think it would be a beautiful story to see someone play Dungeons and Dragons and come to terms with this source or even see it as a gift. And now with all this talk of emotion, let's look at the bard that embodies emotion itself. And again, leaving music and singing aside, this bard gets their power from the manifestation of emotion. This bard, the mood, channels their emotion as a catalyst to their power. They magnify happiness, sadness, fear, love, and if you wanted to channel anger, it would be perfect for your bard barbarian. But with their power over emotion, they can help sway the emotion of other people. You could even reflavor this as the opening or closing of chakras. Or you could be recently exposed to the Feywild, which is the plane that embodies emotion itself. But on the other hand, what if your emotions were not your own and your desires were altered by the wants of another? This bard we call the possessed. There are many spirits that wander the realm with unfinished business searching for resolution. This bard could willingly or forcibly accept a quest from one of these spirits, even acting as a temporary vessel. These spirits could want somebody killed or simply just want their story told before they really pass on. And of course, a bard is the best way to do that. They could also be ancestors that accompany you in keeping alive the oral tradition of their culture. Or your bard could be the unfinished business themselves, ravaged by vengeful voices in their heads with vicious mockery, possessing others with their charming spirit. But like ghosts, I love incorporating other beasts and creatures in Dungeons & Dragons because there are so much in the lore. So adding other creatures to your backstory, let's introduce this bard, the Inheritor. You get your natural charisma straight from creatures who have the innate charisma themselves. You get your natural charisma from creatures that magical charm is genetic. If we look at the sea, we see a siren. If we look at the sky, we see a harpy. If we look at the Feywild, a hag, the abyss, a succubi, the Shadowfell, a vampire, or the Nine Hells, a Rakshasa, where your tabaxi blood could come from a more demonic source. You could also look at races like Triton, Hexblood, or a custom lineage from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. You could literally be offspring of these creatures in some way, or a byproduct of experimentation. You could be exposed to their magic in some sort of supernatural way. Either way, you inherit their ability to manipulate and charm. And Welcome to the Cleric Corner, where we talk about all things Dungeons and & Dragons, and we tap into our higher powers to create worlds that are more unique and stories that are more impactful. Clicking on this video, you might be thinking, boy, what an appropriate video for a channel called the Cleric Corner. This guy must really like clerics. And the answer is, yes, I do. And although I do enjoy all of the other classes in more ways than one, if I had to choose, clerics would take the cake. 
The reason being, clerics are as diverse as the pantheon of gods in your world or the belief systems that you have in place. Each character that is a cleric is so different in personality and power that the flavor and roleplay opportunities, in my opinion, are still so greatly untapped. They really provide a diversity that is also so inclusive. And that's largely why I chose the Cleric Corner to be the title of this channel. Aside from its sweet alliteration, if we just look at the clerical tropes, they are healers, they bring people together, and their wisdom and knowledge adds value to other people. In this case, I'm not sharing a religion or faith in a D&D context, but I do want to share the value to you from what I've gotten from the game. So if I was a D&D cleric, what do you think my subclass would be? So in the spirit of making our clerics more impactful and unique, the D&D Player's Handbook says the following. Divine magic, as the name suggests, is the power of the gods flowing from them into the world. Clerics are conduits of that power, manifesting it as miraculous effects. The gods don't grant this power to everyone who seeks it, but only to those chosen to fulfill a higher calling. But what if your power doesn't come from a god? What if you weren't the chosen one, or what if you don't have a higher calling? Could you still play a cleric? And in my opinion, yes. And you'd be doing the game a favor. You wouldn't be breaking anything mechanically, but unlocking roleplay and experiences and storylines that would otherwise be non-existent. So I will go over 10 ways that clerics could obtain their magic or power, and you can twist it and change it to how you see fit for your own games. We'll start with some simple ones and then get a little crazy. And if this video adds value to you, and you would like me to make similar videos about the other classes, make sure to let me know down in the comments. Also make sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so that we can continue to beat the YouTube algorithm and spread the good word of Dungeons and Dragons. Number one, favor of a god. This is the regular, more common way that clerics get their magic, but I do want to touch on it because there is so much more untapped potential. And I think it's important to know the semantics. This is when the power that you get comes directly from your god, meaning that it is not your power, it's their power being channeled through you. It is also based on the favor and piety that you have in your god. And if your god is displeased with you, or your god finds someone better, you may be looking at losing your powers. And I can already hear the comments saying, wait, take away the power from your players? Like, are you crazy? But why not? As long as the DM and the players have this conversation beforehand, it could make up for fantastic storytelling. If you're familiar with the shows Critical Role or Exandria Unlimited, both the characters Ford and Opal go through this. In my opinion, this relationship is very similar to Warlocks, where your power is subject on somebody else giving it to you. And where the Warlocks may be giving you a written pact, your god is more word of mouth. And to me, that could be a little more dangerous to break. Or in your game, it could simply be based on the honor system. Number two, curse from a god. Speaking of Warlocks, they're a great example of a relationship that your player is not too keen on cultivating. In a clerical standpoint, it doesn't say anywhere that you have to have faith in your god or that you even have to like your god in the first place. Perhaps they forcibly chose you as their champion. Perhaps you are an unwilling vessel for this god. Perhaps you're the chosen one or a fulfiller of a prophecy of a religion that you don't want anything to do with or perhaps cursed in other ways with this god, and just by proximity or relation to him or her or it, you gain their powers. Or perhaps a god has favored your family and has blessed you, the bloodline, with this power, and you want nothing to do with it. And your journey throughout the entire campaign might be either embracing this gift or curse or power that you've been given, or striving to just get rid of it. Number three, faith in your God. In this example, your power doesn't come from your God itself, but rather the faith that you have in your God. The stronger your faith in your deity, the stronger your power becomes. The magic comes from your resolve or your devotion, and paladins are very 
familiar with this idea. However, that does mean that if your character struggles with their faith or starts to disbelieve in their god, it is then that their power might dwindle. And in that situation, they might have another god that they gain faith in, or the DM would allow them to completely change their subclass or class altogether. Either way, I like this option because it puts the power in the player's hands, where it's not the god telling them if or if not they can have their powers, but solely based on their own choices and what they choose to believe in. Number four, scripture. We are already familiar with gaining magic through hard work and study through the wizard class. The wizard devotes themselves to memorization and learning the mathematics when it comes to magic, growing their intellect. And in the cleric's case, they could probably do the same thing with scripture. But instead of learning things like mathematic equations, the clerics are learning the tenets of their god. And in this way, they learn how to cast spells by the way that they act. Or scripture could just be an assortment of divine mathematic equations. In this way, the clerics devote themselves to the memorization of scripture, and instead of intelligence, they grow their wisdom. There have been attempts with Unearth Arcana and subclasses with a theurgy wizard, but I'm talking about clerics today. And as these clerics continue to learn from their good book, they will continue to grow in their power. But just like the wizard, it may not be a good idea to lose that book. Number five, belief in yourself. Forget the gods. You find magic in the tenets and beliefs of love, peace, belonging, etc. You may be, in this case, a philosophy cleric, where you have certain ideals and values and morals or other commitments that you believe in so much that it manifests power within you. What if the world has no gods? Or your character just has faith in themselves to get the job done? I think there's definitely magic in that. And as long as your character is strong in these beliefs, they are a force to be reckoned with. And this is a fun example because it can actually lean a lot into charisma stats instead of wisdom. And hey, if it makes sense for your player, let them use charisma casting instead of wisdom casting when they cast their spells. I don't think that's too much of a price to pay for a really good story and a really good backstory. Number six, herbs and medicine. Again, gods may be non-existent or you may just have not found one you really liked, but you still want to heal people. You still want to help people. You are the battle medic. And this could take a lot of reflavoring, but the mechanics still stay the same. Your healing spells and other spells could take the form of quickly compiling a potion on the fly and throwing them at other players. Or you can easily MacGyver these concoctions at the beginning of each day as you prepare your spells. Or you could compare this magic to the way the artificer gets their magic, where you write runes or something similar on items that give off these spells. Now, you may be sitting there wondering at this point, well, you mentioned wizard and paladin and artificer, why don't you just play those classes? And I say, if those classes fit better to your character that you wanna play, do that. But if you prefer playing a cleric and prefer the mechanics and the way the cleric is played, or you wanna go about it in just a unique way, these options are for you. Besides, if you look at the mechanics outside of the game and just kind of picture it as a real world, magic is fluid and weird. It's not this person a wizard and this person is a druid. People just have magic and it manifests in countless ways. As long as you're having fun, we can think outside the box a little bit. Number seven, your blood. You may have some mommy or daddy issues in the sense that you are a descendant of a greater or lesser deity. Being on good terms with them is irrelevant, but the power is literally your birthright. You can flex those heavenly muscles and unleash the power within you. Maybe you don't even know who your parents are and you're trying to figure out where your powers came in the first place. And again, this would be when the divine sorcerer just wouldn't fit the bill. Perhaps a lot of your divine magic takes the form of electricity and thunder. You could be a descendant of Kord, the Stormlord, and take the Tempest Domain Cleric. Don't want a god involved at all? You could get this power from ancestors who have passed on. Or you could just get the power from whatever plane of existence you want. A Twilight Cleric from the Shadowfell that's absorbing magic from it? That's pretty cool. 
Number eight, divine magic item. Imagine your character goes out adventuring and comes upon a magic item from a deity. In this case, we'll say a helm or a helmet. When the player puts on the helm, the divine powers is imbued into this character. The character doesn't even need to have faith in this god or know even who this god is. It could be that this character could don and doff this helm as needed, or it could be cursed and they can never take off the helm. Or if you wanted to make an entire growth arc for your character, this could be the start of a whole deific set. Is deific a word? Sure where as they journey, they find something like a book or a scepter or a reliquary, where their level up system is entirely based on finding these magic items or practicing them as they go. Normally, these items wouldn't have any additional benefits unless you're a really kind dungeon master and implement some sort of feat system or other abilities that add to the cleric. And you can avoid other players using these items by connecting them all to the original item that the cleric was bonded to. It could be the mere preference of this forgotten god, just really favoring this particular cleric, or something about the nature of the cleric themselves that maybe they don't know about. It's up to you. Number nine, your followers. Let's say you're part of an organized religion or a cult if you wanna go that route. Let's go even further and say that you are the leader of this organization and that your power literally comes from the plethora of followers that believe in you and you derive power from their devoutness to your cause or purpose. And this could implement so many interesting facets where not only are you an adventurer, but you also have followers to please, promises to keep, and a church to keep running while you're out and about adventuring. As long as you have the followers that continue to support you while you're out doing whatever you set out to do, you'll have the power to do it. Number 10, and this one's a big one, the priesthood. On the other end of the spectrum with organized religion, you don't gain your power from followers, but you gain power from the hierarchy. Priesthood is the hierarchy in the organization or church or cult where they delegate the leaders and the responsibility in the organization. Instead of the power going from the bottom up, it comes from the top down. The top clerics or acolytes choose who this gift is given to, and as other organization members are promoted or given facets of leadership, they are then given these powers through a method of laying on of hands or a similar method, thus obtaining a rank or a station inside the organization. This could also go beyond religion or faith uh, if you want to use some of the other methods in a hierarchy coming from a government or a hierarchy coming from a guild or any other organization that you can think of. But the real question is, if you got your power from them, where did they get their power? Now, these are just the beginning of so many ideas and backstories that I can think of, but I just want you to play your cleric the way that you want to and have fun doing it. And I can't wait for the unique stories and experiences that you guys will have, and hopefully you'll share it with me. Hmm? Ah. Oh. So you want to be a cleric, but you're unsure where to start. Not many ideas rattling around in that head. It's okay. You're unsure. I'm here to help, child. Let us explore ways that you may not have thought of yet. Come, the sermon's starting. Hello, Acolytes! Welcome to the Cleric Corner. My name is Riker, and here we talk about all things Dungeons & Dragons, tapping into our higher powers to create worlds more unique and stories more impactful. Now, I wanted to make this part two Cleric video, frankly, because the original Cleric video was a little bit different format than the other ones that I made in the series, mainly because I had done it before the series really took off. So I'm here to remedy that with 10 more fun and evocative ideas for your next Cleric character. And who knows, if this video gets enough likes, I guess I'll just be forced to do a part two for all of them. But to those new to the channel, these will be reflavors and reskins to make the cleric just a little bit different than what we might see in the player's handbook. So for example, let's look at a cleric whose organization isn't from the priesthood or church, but giant folk. The Ordiner cleric is one tied to the ordining of giants. The ordining is the magical hierarchy and social structure of giant kin. In ascending order of superiority, we first start with Ettons and Ogres. Then we have hill giants and then stone giants and then frost giants and then 
fire giants, and then fog giants, and then cloud giants, and then storm giants. With the storm giants really reigning supreme in this hierarchy. Usually creatures like Furbolgs or Goliath usually fit on the bottom of this hierarchy as well. But it also depends on skills and capabilities, and one can move up and down this hierarchy. But think of your character being able to tap into one of these levels of the Ordening. A Forge Cleric being able to tap into Fire Giants, or the Tempest Cleric being able to tap into Storm Giants. Or an Order Domain Cleric that just embodies the actual order. I guess that would make it the Ordner Domain Cleric? What would really be fun is that if your DM actually allows you a certain superiority over other giants below you in the ordning, maybe giving you advantage on persuasion checks or something. The amount of possibilities are literally huge. But let's talk about a cleric who is involved with worshipping a number of other creatures, but this time a little bit more general. The cult cleric finds their magic from devotion to creatures that are not deities and not gods. In specific, we're talking about quasi-deities outlined in page 11 of the DMG. It says quasi-deities have a divine origin, but they don't hear or answer prayers, grant spells to clerics, or control aspects of mortal life. They are still immensely powerful beings, and in theory could ascend to godhood if they amass enough worshippers. Quasi-deities fall into three subcategories, demigods, titans, and vestiges. But which is it? My question, why not? If a quasi-deity can achieve godhood, then there should be a, some amount of power within that process. And within a cult or following, that deity can absolutely send powers to their clerics. A great example of this would be the Traveler from Critical Role. But notice some quasi-deities are called titans. You know what else fits into this category? Krakens, Astral Dreadnoughts, Atropals, and you guessed it, the Tarrasque. But at my table, I'd even let them go as far as worshipping a Beholder or a Sphinx. Your cleric could be a part of this cult or even leading it. If you wanted to take this also purely conceptually, there are a lot of inanimate objects that develop a cult following. Things like television series, books, video games, or music. You can't deny that there isn't magic in those communities. Make a cleric of a cult following. But taking this even further, because we can and we have absolute creative license in our games, our power comes from creatures that don't even exist. The Myth Cleric is obsessed with mythological creatures that haven't existed for a long time, or again, haven't existed at all. But they still find power in their stories and find faith in what they represented or did. They dive into religions that have not been practiced over thousands of years. But it's kind of like someone from today's age getting their magic from Hercules or Achilles. In your campaign, this could be the old gods that existed before this new pantheon came in and replaced them. You know, tying in some ancient god war or something. But if these stories were built on lies and false facts, this is where you can mess with your players just a little bit. In D&D, there is a deity called Sarek, the god of lies. They could be the one that's actually feeding your cleric powers while well, they believe it's something entirely different. Or this doesn't have to be Sirik, it really could be any trickery domain god that you have in your setting. Who said your cleric had to know who they're worshipping in order to get their magic? But now that we've covered the past, let's look toward the future. Instead of the gods, we have futuristic technology and experimentation. The probed cleric is given their power by some ancient alien race. Others might be doubtful of their stories of being abducted and probed, but once they shoot out of a laser cannon that's been embedded into their wrist, others might think differently. Your sanctuary is a force field and your spiritual weapon a hologram. And these aliens that probed you are invested in their experiment and want to see how you interact with the world around you. So eventually your divine intervention could be a flying saucer that comes in and beams up the Baylor. The magic itself could be futuristic, as in your world, healing magic may not exist yet. Clerics don't exist in the way that includes the class until now. These aliens could be benevolent in trying to slowly introduce this technology to force your society into the next age. But speaking of technology, let's say that you were the hardware, an artificer's invention of the Healbot Cleric. And some of you may already be familiar with Fresh Cut Grass from Critical Role. You yourself could either be built to replace the gods or aid additional in a fight. You roll around with mechanical sutures to heal and revivify through paddles with an electric charge. The artificer could have even built you with divine glyphs or sigils instead of arcane ones. Your additional level ups could be from new parts or upgrades. Your inner workings could also include your kits. So when you place ingredients inside of you, 
Your herbalism kit makes potions and comes out ready to use. Your divine intervention could be your wiring or sigils acting up and not working right, creating some sort of magical effect. If you all want to see a lot of these ideas, especially ones from my other videos conceptualized in a subclass or other homebrew, you can visit my Patreon where my supporters get free content every month as well as other perks. And if that's not your thing, you can also find them on my website, all linked below. But as always, subscribe to the channel so you always know when a next video comes out. But getting back to it, this cleric retains their magic in a regular way, however, the way they obtain it is unique. The pilgrim cleric, by definition, has completed a journey or a task that no one else has finished before. They have undergone a pilgrimage or a journey that's well known and respected among their community. And by completing the associated task, they are given boons and a title. This could be a coming of age ceremony by solving a riddle from a sphinx, or a lone journey across the continent from one tribe to another. Kind of what the long staircase represents in Encanto when they reach the top and get their door. The magic may even come from community or tradition itself, or in the effort of completing the task, you unlocked the magic that was already within you. Perhaps it was a test to see if you were among the special in your community. And because you tested well, you were taken from your family to fulfill a greater purpose. But speaking of a higher purpose, your cleric could be tied into the very fabric of the realm. The Tuning Fork cleric has been the ties to the planes from the cosmology of D&D lore. Your soul acts as the gate to the realm or plane where your deity comes from. In this world, the gods take full advantage of the clerics that worship them. In some ways, it's kind of like Heimdall from Thor. And as your god needs a window to peer into the material realm to keep tabs on things, your cleric is literally that window. But because of that, they are also the material component when it comes to traversing planes. They are a tuning fork having become attuned to the plane that they worship. These clerics may also be a vessel for the god when they need to come in and speak to their other acolytes. The cleric obviously offering themselves willingly to those needs. Perhaps your party does need to find a specific NPC that worships a god from another plane that you need to get to. Or this cleric could have originated from this plane and their god yo-yos them back and forth as they go out to investigate the material realm. But in my mind, if our souls aren't attuned to a certain plane of existence, then what happens to our spirit when we die? How does it know where to go? So just thinking that in order for your soul when you die to go to Mount Celestia, it already has to be attuned to it. But that also means that the soul of the individual who never worshiped a god might be right for the taking for whoever. But with the yo-yo idea, this would actually be a really good opportunity for your players that might not be available every single week that you play. On a bad work schedule week, that's just their god pulling them back to the realm that they came from. Whether it be tied to Bahamut from Mount Celestia, or Mistra from the Plane of Mechanus. But with multiple planes also comes multiple worlds. Stars, moons, suns, and planets. Instead of radiance from the gods, the Star Child Cleric gets their radiance from heavenly bodies and the constellations. You could have been imbued with a shard of a moonstone or born next to a meteorite. You could have been in a ritual where the stars or planets lined up perfectly, or hit with a radiation sunburst from one of the many stars in your solar system. In a Spelljammer campaign, you could get your magic from the wild space itself, or companionship with a radiant dragon, or take inspiration from the movie Stardust, where you're the star yourself, fallen into the material world by being knocked down or pulled out of the sky. It's your mission to find out who brought you down here and how to get back up into the sky where you belong. But I really do like the idea of your radiance coming from actual light instead of the gods. So up next, we'll talk about the frequency cleric. Light itself is a bandwidth or frequency that's translated into color by our eyes. But other frequencies that we don't see are sound waves, ultraviolet, or radio waves, all on a spectrum that we perceive differently. So even like we control those waves now, your cleric could manipulate the wavelengths and frequencies around them, making blasts of gamma rays or even x-rays. Or you could have a more spiritual approach where there are sciences where frequencies affect us in our body through chakra. Create a chakra cleric and play with chakra chants. You know, the um sounds, you know what I'm talking about. Or just have an assortment of singing bowls that each one as you make the sound creates a spell. But just clerical powers being solely flavored to sound or light is so cool. Where would you land on the spectrum? Next up on the list, we have a cleric more of arcane origin. Clerics are known for their power over the undead in their base class. So why not have the necromancer cleric? If you lean in more into the wizardy archetype, 
Your familiarity with undead gives you more power when you hit them, as well as the ability to turn them away when they're not yours. Some might even argue that it makes a better necromancer than the necromancer wizard. But going with the right cleric, it might also provide opportunity for a fun necromancer gish. As a necromancer, your magic could also come in the form of curses or hexes, not unlike witches or hags that have their way of natural healing with dark magic. But knowing that clerics generally do point to focus towards undead, I want you to think outside the box a little bit and how we can switch that out with something else. If your cleric is indifferent to undead, as a lot of gods are, why not have them able to turn fiends or aberrations? Because I'm sorry, a nature cleric of the wild mother that can turn plants instead of undead is just so narratively pleasing. Just talk with your DM and make sure that there is a prevalent force of plants within your campaign. But just like rangers can choose their favorite foe, allow your cleric to choose the thing that their god sent them to defeat. But as we continue to build upon and explore different archetypes, please share other ideas that you may have had in the comments below. Oh, hello there. <laughs> I'm gonna put this away. <clears throat> Oof. <laughs> Clean your fake plants. <laughs> okay, let's do this. Today we're gonna talk about druids. You know, because they're adherents to nature. For reference, in the player's handbook, it says that druids revere nature over all, gaining spells and other magical abilities from nature itself or from a nature deity. But, what if they didn't? What if they got their power from some other force? What if it was given to them forcefully? Let's explore what being a druid really could mean in your character concepts. And this way, the shape of your druid will truly be wild. Welcome to the Claret Corner. My name is Riker, and here we talk about all things Dungeons and Dragons, tapping into our higher powers to create worlds that are more unique and stories that are more impactful. If you haven't already, go and check out my other videos on other classes where I dive into other origins of their class magic, setting aside what is explicitly stated in published books. In that way, these ideas are mine, so take some, leave some, and do what's best for your game. I'll be going over 10 ideas to expand on the druid and help you in your next character concept. So diving right in, what we do know about druids is one, their affinity for nature, and two, their ability to change into animals. But what if a druid is obsessed with the exact opposite of what normal druids stand for? Instead of nature, a druid could be obsessed with civilization or order or law. These could be druids representing the social structure of bees or monkeys. So our first idea for the druid will be the city. Now, places of population are like nature in being full of life, social impacts, and symbiotic relationships. These druids might want to combine nature and civilization together, or wish to completely alter nature to be more in line with the structure of civilization, bringing more of a mathematical view to the world. These druids could be more in tune with pigeons or rats on the street or the sewer. And in this way, it could be closer to a shaman, where druids are agents of the nature and they commune with those outside of it, the shaman is agents of civilization that communes with nature, if that makes sense. The druid learns from civilization to better nature, and the shaman learns from nature to better civilization. Shamans are the ones that learn from the forest and the rivers to know exactly how to build a castle on top of them. After all, what's a city but just another biome of nature? There honestly should be a tally on how many times I say nature in this video. Just saying. But speaking of expansion and science, let's look at the Biomancer Druid, an artificial connection with nature given by experiments or substance effects. These incantations could be done to you unwillingly, or you willingly go out and try to graft yourself with animals or nature. An example that comes to mind would be the Simic hybrids in Eberron. These would also fit well in a future setting, but it could just be a wizard that temporarily forgets about morality. But in taking a potion, actually grafting yourself with animal parts, or exposing yourself long enough to certain magics, you take on druidic features in a very non-conventional way. But on that note, you could very well inherit these abilities without modifying genetically. You could already have bestial or animal DNA since birth. Looking at now, the beast druid, this could come from a source of lycanthropy from your ancestors, or simply evolutionary traits that have been passed down for thousands of years. I could see a shifter being a druid not by choice, but by lineage. And you could have complete control over this ability to morph into an animal that 
could be extinct. And if this bestial nature came from thousands and thousands of years ago, you could have complete control into changing into a dinosaur or a woolly mammoth. Or you can fight against this bestial nature in your wild shape, being overwhelmed by the primal vices of this form, which could in this way multi-class well with barbarian. Now this blood of yours could also come from a draconic lineage, so I introduce the dragon druid. And sure, I know that we already have a draconic sorcerer, but in my opinion, the druid is the best at elemental spells, which fit well with the dragon. So if you're going to explore the full range of chromatics and metallic dragons, druids are a better fit. And dragons are also known to polymorph into humanoids and other creatures, so there's your wild shape. You can be influenced directly from a red dragon and be the circle of wildfire druid, or you can be influenced by a green dragon and be circle of spores. Or you can really tap into the lair actions and regions of dragons and be the circle of land. And I know that everyone's still on the Fizzband's Treasure of Dragons kick, so I had to add it in there. If you like these ideas so far, let me know by liking the video and subscribing to my channel. This lets me know to keep uploading videos like this. And if there are other classes that I haven't done yet that you would like to see, please add them to the comments below. So on to the next type of druid, we can say that your blood comes from beasts or dragons, but what if instead of white and red blood cells, you have chlorophyll? And yes, I'm talking about being a descendant from plants or nature itself. And this druid we call the Dryad, obviously being descendants of these nature spirits. Also known as nymphs and naiads, these are personifications of nature and manifestations of things like forests, swamps, and deserts. In Greek mythos, these spirits are very well known for breeding with other creatures, so it would depend on whatever your lore is in your world. Another way of being an offspring of nature is a tree ant, which you can literally be a tree. I would use the Warforged or the Autonome sap blocks for it. But continuing to expand our horizons a little bit, druids can find other mystical sources for their powers, even beyond the physical plane. As we know, when druids and other classes use the Summon Beast spell or find familiar, these beasts usually come in the form of a fey spirit, meaning they came from the plane of the Feywild. Spirits that only took the form of these beasts in that moment. But what if they weren't fey? What if they came from another plane? Introducing the planar druid. Let's say instead of a fey spirit inhabiting your beast, it comes in the form of a demon or a devil. In Celtic culture, where druids come from, you might be familiar with Baphomet, a deity from the 14th century that now manifests as a demon in D&D 5e. Your druid could work more with pentagrams and black candles. Even more, you could have your spirits come from the Shadowfell, where it represents the corruption and the darkness of nature. Or it could come from any of the elemental planes if you focus on more of an elemental druid. But dealing with all these planes could end in catastrophe, especially dealing with devils. But then again, deals and curses are a great way to start a druid on their journey. Next on the list is the cursed druid. A druid could easily get their powers from shaking hands with a hag, having a more Feywild background, making a deal with the devil could result in more blood magic. But what if nature itself was the one that did the cursing? A good example in my mind would be Davy Jones and his crew in Pirates of the Caribbean. They were cursed to take on the elements of the ocean and the nature therein. Another one would be The Rock in the movie The Jungle Cruise with his associates. Spoiler alert, they angered the river and the river made them part of it. So what if you wronged nature in some way and it retaliated? It cursed you with elements of itself as you desperately try to rid yourself of this curse. But another curse could be focused on your wild shape. What if you were an animal to begin with and you were cursed to be a humanoid of some type? And you could only change back into that form a couple times a day until you break that curse. Continuing on this idea of being a past animal, what if you were an animal in a past life and you can tap into these lives at will? This druid we call the reincarnate. Be it a fox or a boar or a snake, you could have been them all, and you can reach back and cultivate the knowledge that you've gained in each life. And this might depend heavily on your DM on if reincarnation is even a thing in your world. However, if not, you could still flavor this and tap into animal spirits around you that have passed on. Animal ancestors that you can embody temporarily, gaining their experience and communing with them when you wild shape. A ghost dog whisperer of sorts. But whatever faith or religion you have in your world, I imagine you still have star constellations. And taking a bit from astrology, we have the Starborn Druid, where you're given your abilities dependent on the nature of your birth. 
It could be only a certain type of year that druids are born with druidic abilities. Or you could rule that depending on your sign, you can be any one of the druidic circles. If you were an Aquarius, you could be Circle of the Moon. Or if you were Cancer, you could be Circle of the Shepherd. Or if you were Capricorn, you could be the Circle of Dreams. But your horoscope could determine which aspect of nature you could be pulling from. These circles could also be dependent on weather patterns, star alignment, or solstices. But again, either way, it's not the Druid that chooses the nature, it's nature that chooses the Druid. If we lean back into nature and plants, next we get the Consumer. This druid doesn't rely on communion with nature, but consuming of it and application of it. Nature didn't choose it, it chose nature. And in order to cast nature magic, they need the right assortment of magical plants and fungi. And if taken in the correct mixture, it gives them the abilities to wild shape and do magical things. This idea takes elements from the Witcher or even modern witches. Along with plants, you can tap into energy or chakra stones to imbue your magic in as well. As long as you wear these crystals around your neck, you can channel the power around you. You might even need to ingest precious metals to manifest your power, much like the Mistborn series. But you can look anywhere, books or movies, to find inspiration for your next druid. Fight! Hello Acolytes! Welcome to the Cleric Corner. My name is Riker, and here we talk about all things Dungeons & Dragons, tapping into our higher powers to create worlds more unique and stories more impactful. Fighters are arguably the most popular class in Dungeons & Dragons, at least to the point that more fighters are played than any other class. Which is weird because you'd think that this would then be the most requested class, but here we are towards the end of our Better Class series and we'll leave it on a high note. But according to the player's handbook, fighters are the wielders of many different weapons and take the form of soldiers and knights. But perhaps you think that these archetypes are a little overused and wish to add a little bit more flair to your next fighter character. Character. What if your fighter was a sport athlete or got their strength from a god? I'll be going over 10 unique fighter concepts to try to subvert what our idea is about the fighter. Let's get our second win and surge towards some new ideas. Like and subscribe to stay alerted for new videos and help the ever unforgiving YouTube algorithm. But to show you what I mean, let's talk about a fighter who's thrown many punches in his life but has never hit a soul. With the playwright fighter, he's been in many plays and performances that reenact or depicted wars and battles. These live shows to entertain the public are choreographed and practiced. When the fighter throws a punch, he hits his own hand to make a slapping sound. Fooling the audience, of course, to seem like he punched the other person, all you theater kids will know exactly what I mean. They take their memorized footwork and apply it where they can. Their second wind in this case, an intermission, and their action surge in encore. And these are also your LARPers who've practiced and played the sword for so long that they're so excited to finally get out and experience the real thing. And maybe for some of these entertainers, there might be a few things that held them back physically from going out and experiencing the world, whether it be a missing arm or a missing leg. Characters with physical disabilities can be endearing and inspiring to other characters. The disabled fighter goes out adventuring just because they were told that they couldn't. But the roleplay elements of a fighter embracing even overcoming and seeing the disabilities as strengths is something that I would enjoy seeing at more tables. Or it could be a disabled war vet that's forced back into fighting because of a war or an alien invasion. Perhaps they're even mute, blind, or deaf. And where you might have disadvantage with perception with your eyesight, you might have advantage with perception with your smell. But whatever your disability is, you're out to prove your worth without it. It's your daredevil character, if you will. But let's say the disability isn't physical, but within magic, where possibly your whole life you've wanted to be a wizard, but your birth abnormality keeps you from casting magic. And because of that impossibility, you have to make up for that lack of power in your fighting. And you kind of get to experience that wizards are stronger than fighters in a very meta way. But what if instead of using these disabilities to their advantage, they often strive to replace that disability to make them normal through magic or future tech or by symbiote. And weirdly, my mind goes to the movie Ratatouille where Linguini was only the greatest chef ever because someone else was pulling the strings. I'll let you figure out who or what might be the entity pulling those strings. But speaking of another hero with physical disability, 
they sought out science to make up for it. With the super soldier fighter, they are enhanced beyond what a normal human can do. Definitely not your average guard or townsperson with a pitchfork. But with super intelligent artificers like Iron Man and incredible sorcerers like Doctor Strange, the fighter has to have something in order to compete. Or they could have other modifications or mutations in other ways, like somehow they can't feel pain or they have developed thicker skin. There's a ton of mutations that your fighter can obtain through genetic mutations or by science experiments. And some might argue that you don't need powers to be super, so live out your vigilante dreams and be a Batman-esque type character. In the real world, obviously there is not mutants or super soldier serum, but people still try a number of things to improve their bodies. So with the stimulant fighter, they look elsewhere for other performance aids. They may have a bag of smelling salts to induce adrenaline, or some less legal performance enhancing drugs. Creatine, steroids, or actual adrenaline, or whatever the magic equivalent is in your world. There's a plethora of options in magical fauna and fungi, but other methods as well have proved useful in bodily improvements, meditation or hypnosis being big ones. Perhaps your fighter puts themselves to sleep and let their body take over. But you can't talk about stimulants without talking about the place where they're regularly used, not just in the fighting ring, but also in sports. So next we'll look at the Olympian fighter, those that competed in sports for entertainment instead of the stage like your playwright. Professional Professionals in the world of shot put, fencing, archery, and javelin throwing. Competitors that are in such peak physical condition that they have no issue translating their sport into their fighting styles. I mean, go crazy. Perhaps your soccer player or skater puts knives on their feet. Or the tennis player sets up a serve to slash the enemy with a sword instead of a tennis racket. A hockey player adopts a fighting style where they're sweeping the legs. Just remember that your fighter didn't always have to be a fighter, but was possibly forced into it. So their style is very reminiscent of the occupation that they had beforehand. Now, I'll take a break here and say that even though a lot of these class concepts are just for reflavoring, I have made multiple subclasses on some of the archetypes we've discussed, posted in my Discord. However, going forward, in the effort of funding better content for you guys, I'll be taking them and putting them on my new website. Selling some of my creative energy there and getting a few cents back will really help in the direction that I want to take this channel. But of course, my patrons who have supported me in so many other ways will still be getting them for free. I have been so grateful for all of your guys' support, and I hope that this can take us to the next level. And that it's only because of you that I've gotten to this point. So I really look forward to what we can create together. Link in the description. But going on, there is a huge media archetype that I really want to talk about. And you're probably familiar with it, although you probably haven't heard the term before. The archetype being someone from this real world, somehow finding themselves in a world that's more magical and mystical. We call them the Isekai. And examples of this would be Peter Pan, Alice in Wonderland, The Matrix, Chronicles of Narnia, Santa Claus, or Space Jam. The Isekai is you, somehow falling in between realities or down a rabbit hole and finding yourself in a world with more dragons and more dungeons. And once you've entered the land, you may already know a little bit about it, but didn't think that it actually existed. Like you know about Looney Tunes, but you'd never expect to be in a world with them. Or you could just be completely unfamiliar with it and you have to learn as you go. Either way, you have to learn quickly to survive, so you pick up a sword and join the first adventuring group that you lay eyes on. And fun fact, the original Dungeons and Dragons and animated series was just a bunch of isekai characters. But speaking of popular TV tropes, let's look at our favorite investigator, Sherlock Holmes. But specifically for this example, we'll be using the Robert Downey Jr. version. In the film, his super intelligence, or more of super perception, allows him insight into the fight to know exactly what moves his opponent will have and where his opponent will be. Because sometimes it's not just about hitting your enemies hard. Fighting is just a much of a mental game as it is a physical one. It's about convincing your opponent that you're going to win even before the fight has even started, inserting that seed of doubt to make them hesitate when it counts. This fighter is full of sarcastic quips, insults, and humor that lowers your opponent's guard and pulls their focus just long enough for you to strike, because they know how to manipulate their opponent with their fist and with their mouth. But perhaps being able to predict what your opponent will do 
maybe you peering into the future for a couple of seconds. Perhaps your fighting styles are more magical than you give it credit for. With the Somatic Fighter, your second wind is basically like a false life spell that you cast on yourself. Your Action Surge, a little haste spell, and your improved critical, a hex. Or your Action Surge and second wind is more of a time magic, where you rewind time to heal wounds, or you slow time down enough to get two attacks in one round. This leads to many fighter subclasses who are already primed for magic. Now let's pull some inspiration from your fighter character outside of the medieval time period. Add some color and diversity in your fighter with the culturalist. Throughout history, we've had many flavors of fighters, and it's about picking and choosing and pulling inspiration from them. We already have the samurai warrior archetype, of course, but what if your fighter was more of a Native American warrior? Or pirates, cowboys, ancient Koa warriors, even Spartans, Vikings, and so much more. You could even pull inspiration from mythos and history with Genghis Khan, Hercules, Beowulf, Attila the Hun, Achilles, Vlad the Impaler, Spartacus, Julius Caesar, just to name a few. You could have been one of these great warriors or trained by one. You could have been their squire before they died or mysteriously disappeared. Or you could have just been trained by the ghost of one of these characters, specially chosen to finish off what your master had started so many years previous. Now, it's also important to mention that some of those fighters listed actually got their power from gods. Perhaps your fighter was not endowed by science or magic, but by a god themselves. The endowed fighters are given strength and tactics of the gods, specifically perhaps the god of war. The mythos of ancient Greece were full of these, full of gods among men. You could get your power from Ares or Zeus, or in D&D mythos, you could get it from Tempest, Lord of Battles, or Cord the Stormlord. These gods, of course, not giving you powers like a cleric or a paladin, but literally imbuing your body with godlike strength, almost downloading battle tactics like the Matrix. You could reflexively catch a punch and break their arm instinctually as you're still getting used to your new power. Now, you could be the chosen one of these gods, of course, but why not make it a little funner and you be number two? Because they had given all of these powers to someone else and they failed then you were the second pick. You were the backup. But the fighter class is very versatile in what you can do. A clean slate as you pick up a sword and become something great. If you've had other ideas while watching this video on how you would reflavor the fighter, or wish to share a fighter that you've played, add them to the comments below. And stick around. Got him. You want what he's having? No. That's what I thought. Justice for Gotham. Hello, Acolytes. Welcome to the Cleric Corner. My name is Riker, and here we talk about all things Dungeons and Dragons, tapping into our higher powers to create worlds that are more unique and stories that are more impactful. Monks are described as monastic fighters or monastic trainees that use magic in the form of ki or chi in their fighting style. And what exactly this ki is would be entirely up to you because today we're going to explore what a monk is and how we can make it fun and unique. For example, what if your monk culled this magic from disease or was enhanced mechanically? There is some debate in the community about the actual strength and validity of the class, but to me, there is no debate when it comes to the flavor of the monk being unmatched by the other classes. But still, today we're going to talk about subverting and even reskinning the monk, so know that you can take your own ideas and make it your own, as these ideas are just mine. So, without further ado, I will be going going over 10 different concepts for your next monk, giving you the key to unlock your next amazing character. For our first monk, let's talk about the key not being the magical essence that we may know, but some sort of energy source from a battery. With the enhanced monk, they rely on robotic attachments to rock really fast and punch really hard. A great example of this would be Vi from Arcane, using the Hex tech to empower her punches. This tech or energy could even be built up and sent out in a blast, much like the Sun Soul can do. And again, you might have attachments to your legs so that you can run faster, or attachments to your brain to stop you from aging. This battery could also come from an entity or some sort of organism, kind of like the Siphon Warlock from my Warlock video. If the futuristic feel doesn't really fit your campaign, you could also go into runic magic. Or these attachments could be steam-powered, 
or just have punching gloves on springs. But to further explore this enhancement idea, instead of the equipment being enhanced that you put on, Perhaps it's you yourself that is being enhanced. This might take a new meaning to your body is a weapon motif. For those who have seen the Terminator, this is your T-1000 monk. For those of you who don't know, in the movie, the T-1000 is a shape-shifting futuristic robot that would transform his limbs into weapons. In this case, for your monk, you can transform your key into these weapons. And since your martial arts die never changes, these weapons can look different depending on how how you want your key to manifest. But how cool is it to have your key just form a warhammer on your hand as you attack your enemy? And this could also fit well with the Kensei Monk if you didn't want to do too much reflavoring. And like the T-100, instead of deflecting missiles, you could be absorbing these projectiles. But you don't just have to look like melted mercury either. This could also take the form of some sort of symbiote. Or you could have magical tattoos on your body that come out into these weapons. Or this could even be your own blood coming out and solidifying. Now, the great thing about Key, in my opinion, is that it's very loosely described in the player's handbook. They say that it's magical, but they don't explicitly say that it's from the weave. So we're gonna continue to make it however we want. And for this next concept, we're going to make Key the literal life essence of all living things parts of their soul. The extractor monk literally pulls pieces of the enemy's souls as they strike, damaging not just their body, but their soul as well. Stunning strike could be pulling a large chunk of soul at once, paralyzing the enemy. A really cool aspect of the monk would be them learning these tactics from demons or devils, who are also known to pull souls. They could be in service to one or pull this knowledge from ancient demonic tomes. If when you pull souls, souls can slowly heal over time, you might even pull this energy from your friends, kind of like the extrovert from my bard video. Or this could be a process of exaltation where you're pulling your own soul and bit by bit, you are letting it go into the ether, slowly separating your soul from your earthly bound vessel. But speaking of souls, maybe instead of extracting them, you become one with another. With the spirit guide monk, you have a connection with an ethereal teacher that teaches you a specific form of martial art. You could be practicing the form of dancing tiger from a feline guide or hidden tiger from a Mushu like character. It could be regular animals like jumping snake or soaring hawk, or you could learn a martial art from an entirely different beast, a fighting style called swaying tree ant or spinning beholder or stomping giant. And again, you can learn these fighting styles from these monster senseis themselves or their spirit form, or you could learn them from books that outline these art forms. And if not from a beast or a monster, you can even channel capabilities from your ancestors, a lineage of hereditary fighting styles that you learn and unlock memories as you level up. Now, another source of key could be coming from planar magic. You could be channeling directly the energy from the fire plane or the Shadowfell or even Mount Celestia. You could be tugging on these links between the planes or opening holes in between the fabric of the universe. The Mercy Monk could even be pulling directly from the positive plane and the negative plane. The Bridge Monk, through training or other means, ties these worlds together. They are a conduit in many ways as their meditation has allowed them to be in touch with a Nirvana or a Valhalla. Their deflect missiles could be pushing projectiles into other planes or the line between them. Slow fall and stunning strike could work the same way. Or their empowered movement could be like an earth glide from the earth plane. Or jet burst as you channel magic from the plane of air. Or your channeling of the plane mechanist might speed up time just enough for you to get off a flurry of blows. But you just have to ask yourself, where is your key coming from exactly? For this next concept, our key comes from something a little bit more depressing. The diseased monk is channeling the very thing that is killing them. And before the comments come at me and saying that the monk is immune to poison and diseases, maybe this is the reason why, that because of this one disease, they become immune to all others. Them being able to manipulate their metabolism in this way has kept all other diseases at bay. Perhaps they are carriers of <clears throat> a pandemic-sized virus 
that they are keeping within themselves by will alone, or they could be using a form of key to keep it inside themselves so it doesn't unleash onto the world. This could be some sort of magical plague or a sickness that affects key itself, or perhaps the accepting of this affliction was some monastic way of rejecting pleasure and accepting pain. A mind versus soul or mind versus body exercise as they go through their path to enlightenment, and they keep this sickness as a reminder of their mortality. These monks turn pain into power with this tradition. But on the path of enlightenment and exaltation, there are multiple avenues on which this could be accomplished. For the stoned monk, they turn to inebriation or intoxication to get to their form of Valhalla or Nirvana. Mushrooms, medicinal herbs, smoking pipes, or powder, these monks try to perfect their body and their mind through the use of substances. These could be rituals with things like peyote or psychedelics, or they could even be experimental in these elixirs that they consume, eventually achieving a a timeless body as they concoct an elixir much like the Fountain of Youth. They could be ones that have trained their bodies to interact with these substances in a specific way. Through occasional small doses, they could reach that perfection or that exaltation that they're searching for, or become something else entirely. With this next concept, sometimes key can unlock something that's always been there. This monk's concept of perfection might mean going back to our evolutionary roots. And with that, you tap into the unrivaled animal savagery of the Wild Hunt monk. Their fighting style is scrappy and feral, but this monk doesn't have to be part of a monastery. They could also be part of a tribe who learn to hunt with their bare hands. Their years of being hermits have given them inhuman speed and acrobatics to pin down wild boars and deer even as they run. They are at home in the wild and always looking for their next prey. Now let's continue to explore monks that don't really have a monastic tie even trading some Eastern fighting styles for some Western ones. For this concept, we look at the boxer, but it doesn't have to be limited to just boxing. Boxing, wrestling, fencing, and lucha libre are all Western styles of fighting that could be translated for the monk. And with these styles, you are similarly dedicated to making your body the best that it can be. But even with that said, who says that your monk has to be limited to one type of fighting style? Why can't they start out knowing a couple or even learn different fighting styles as they level up? Maybe they start out knowing capoeira or taekwondo, and then later on, they learn kickboxing or sumo wrestling. And with these fighting styles that they learn, they can mix and match and make it their own. I just love the mental picture of a stunning strike coming from the belly of a 300 pound sumo wrestler. But speaking of alternative ways of fighting, why not add elements of the arts? Break a leg with the dancer monk. The dancing fighting style might put your enemy into a false sense of security. Ruby, played by Karen Gillan from Jumanji, uses this dance fighting. Dance fighting scenes are also used in many movies to explore sexual tension between two star-crossed lovers. This fighting style can take the form of hip hop, break dancing, ballet, or ribbon dancing, or ballroom dances like tango or pasa doble, or the bunny hop if you're a heron gone race. You could even be creative with your quarterstaff and be a pole dancer, but realize you really can take any form of dance and turn it into a fighting style which might help you next time you need to infiltrate the social banquet of a noble. But with all of these concepts, I just hope that you got a few ideas to make your next monk a good one. And that's your In brightest day, in blackest night, no evil shall escape my smite. Let those who worship evil's might beware my power, paladin's light. Hello Acolytes, welcome to the Cleric Corner. My name is Riker and here we talk about all things Dungeons and Dragons, tapping into our higher powers to create worlds more unique and stories more impactful. According to the Player's Handbook, a paladin is upholders of righteousness that make solemn oaths that give them their power. Committed to God or justice itself, they commit to years of training in order to accomplish their goals. But what if your paladin had nothing to do with gods or oaths? What if their power comes from an altar, or their oaths not being their own, but others' expectations of them? Today, we're going to look at some unique archetypes for the paladin and subversions to that trope. To help you make your next character, I will be going over 10 unique character concepts. So together, we will vow never to make a boring character or NPC ever again. To start off, we not only strip the connection the paladins have to their god, 
but to magic itself. The Demolitioner Paladin uses black powders instead of divine smites. Their weapons are filled with gunpowder or the medieval equivalent that ignites when it hits the enemy. Or you can go all out and attach actual C4 to your sword. You could have your party's artificer provide these or make them yourselves, but you reflavor explosive damage to, well, explosives. Ooh, or if you've ever seen those swords with an actual gun attached to the hilt, load that puppy up and smite with some close ranged bullets. And then everyone in your aura of black powder and sulfur gains the benefits of your vigor. Your healing hands would be burning this gunpowder over wounds to seal them. But if we're going the non-magical route, you can also just reflavor your smites as a similar effect to a sneak attack or as increased damage as spurts of rage like a barbarian. But now let's slap back on the radiant damage to your divine smites because I have a certain bone to pick with the damage types of this class. With the radioactive paladin, your radiant damage is actual radiation. This could come from exposure to gamma radiation or a nuclear bomb. And within this nuclear fallout, they somehow survived absorbing mass amount of radiation within their bodies. Perhaps, of course, through magic, because it makes sense that radiant damage would be radiation. And this is actually confirmed by Chris Perkins himself. When you smite, some of that radiation slips out and burns the exposed skin of your enemies. But then in very small doses with your aura, it actually provides some benefits to your party members. But going forward, I actually want to advocate using other damage types for your smites. Because and this might be an unpopular opinion, but I don't think that all paladins really fit the radiant damage type. Let's take gods for example, and because there are so many different gods with different domains, each cleric or paladin will look different by submitting themselves to that greater deity. Why does the cleric that worships Kord the Stormlord get lightning abilities where the paladin who worships the same deity does not? But why not be able to play out your Thor fantasies and be able to smite with lightning damage? And statistically, the damage type of lightning is resisted more, so it isn't really breaking anything, but why not necrotic smites for an evil god or an oath breaker, or poison for a nature god, or fire damage if your paladin climbed out of hell. In one of my games I even had a paladin that smited with psychic damage who was a thrall of an aboleth. Now this would be entirely dependent on the conversation between you and your DM, but to me not all smites come from the same source. But continuing on the subversion of paladin tropes, let's replace the divine origin of paladin magic to more of an arcane one. The battle mage paladin are school in runic magic and trained to be magical warriors. Each day they carve these glyphs into their sword and then activate them like glyphs of warding to smite their opponents. Your paladin aura looking more like a constant aura of vitality spell. You could even imbue some of your other spells into your sword, making it a magical metal spell book or a really sharp wand. You could be a part of an elite team of gishes and magical assassins that uphold the oaths and vows of the wizard school that taught them. But instead of getting trained at some wizard school, perhaps your paladin was trained at a monastery. After all, monks in the real world are very much known for the oaths and the promises that they make. Oaths like chastity, poverty, obedience, and stability, all in the name of personal progress. The abbot paladin uses oaths like these to get their magical abilities. Getting it through anointing or ritual or discipline or meditation, all mixed in with years of self-denial. But this calmness is contagious for those that are around you. These are your Jedi Knights who are literally described as warrior monks who keep the peace in the universe. You uphold the ideals of your order as you push back the dark side. In a medieval setting, you could even deny the gods and blame them for all of the trouble in the world and that you, can do much better, your O's making up for where the gods lacked. And sometimes that drive is to keep going, to finish what you started. And sometimes that drive, or your O's, are the only thing that's keeping you alive. A great example of the doomed paladin is Kate from the movie of the same name. An assassin poisoned by her enemy, only having 24 hours to find out who did it and exact revenge. Interestingly enough, the poison was actually concentrated radiation, so this could also be coming from your radioactive paladin. But through sheer will alone, and I think five injections of adrenaline, she finished her task. Perhaps your paladin is manifesting abilities because they are dying, and they are desperate to finish their business before it becomes unfinished business. And perhaps their whole life they did the wrong thing, 
and they want to end their life on a good note. And if you think that this video adds value to you, consider subscribing. And please hit that like button as it does give me the benefit of a shield of faith against YouTube's relentless algorithm. And then we can continue to grow and share as we advocate for creativity and new ideas. Let's work together to better every table. But now this next concept gets a little bit video gamey, which I'm not sure a lot of you may be into, but I assure you there is a lot of flavor as we look at the Power Up Paladin. In games like Super Smash Bros. Mortal combat or Pokemon with moves like Mirror Coat, there is a special move that you only get to use if you are hit enough or you hit your opponent enough. Once the bar is full, you get to unleash a super attack on them, releasing a bunch of damage. So why not flavor your smite in a similar way? Pulling essence from your opponents to smite them back with it. Perhaps you're religious and you pull sins from your enemy and send it back to them in the form of guilt damage. Or we could flavor it as blood magic, where your sword absorbs the blood of your enemy to fuel magical attacks. Or as you hit, you slowly just learn where your enemy's weak spots are and then you wait for the opportune moment to hit it hard. But something that both video games and the D&D world share are adventures and quests. And sometimes power is only given to an individual to complete the task or adventure at hand. So with the quest paladin, their O's are goals to achieve and not requirements to uphold. In fact, they're at the very beginning of their journey and they're not great at upholding the O's that they are tied to. They are weak, they are human. And your paladin does not have to be perfect at their O's, contrary to what lore might tell you. But their quest could be trying to achieve that level of dedication or redemption. Or their quest could look like go and fight and kill this dragon, or go and find this new world, and they are given the power in order to complete that task. Power doesn't come from perfection, but the power comes from trying their best. But sometimes a certain quest or task needs to be completed However, there's no one around to do it. So citizens pray desperately for help to deliver them from this evil. So much so that the gods hear and an exemplar is born. A warrior angel created from the divine weave as an answer to prayer. Or a lesser angel that's given mortality from an empathetic god. Or you were dead and you were revived by a god who needs something done. Or perhaps the whole world itself is plunged into evil and in order to tip the scales back the other way, they created you. You were born in war with the purpose to end it. Having no parents, you leave the realm once your task is completed. Or in a lesser case, the exemplar could just be a regular person chosen by the public as one type of chosen one. They force their ideals on you even though you may not share them. Their profound expectations on you are a literal magical weight. And it's your choice either to uphold those expectations or make new ones for yourself. And continuing on the idea of your O's not being your own and placed on you by other people, we look at the representative paladin because reputation is a powerful thing. And sometimes many people might look to you to represent the ideals and the morals and values of the larger population. The representative is a leader of the people, a king, a tribal leader, a politician, or in some instances, an advocacy group head. Like the Electoral College in America, we vote for individuals who we think will represent what we believe is right. Perhaps the population's views align with an oath of redemption paladin, or possibly an oath of vengeance paladin, and through their vow to uphold their office, they get their powers. This could also represent the values of law enforcement who also make oaths in office. Or even a parole officer who has been assigned to watch over the rogue in your party. Or it could be passed down as a title or station that you've had in your family for generations, you being a noble in your own kingdom. But expanding that a little bit more, what if a community's values are so powerful and they share it so deeply with each other that all of them manifest oath-like abilities just for being a part of that organization? I also admit that that sounded a little borderline culty. <laughs> but oath, bonds, vows of any capacity can be powerful in their own right. Some of law and some of heart. The bride and groom paladin get their magic from their dedication to each other. Going beyond some signatures that you get at a courthouse, but a magical bond that fuses two souls together. In contrast, it could be an arranged marriage in order to unleash these magical abilities, making the bond more of a political one. Or perhaps your paladin is just getting their powers because of the dedication that they have to the party that they're in. But again, these vows can come from any promise. Perhaps a vow from a father to their son, 
or a Hippocratic Oath. You have to ask yourself, who or what does your paladin dedicate their lives to? Do they vow a life of thievery, or do they promise themselves that they are going to get a seashell from every beach that they visit in the world? That one's a little bit of a joke, but still. Or why not a teacher's oath that they make for the desire to bring up a better generation to improve the world around us? But first, why not improve on these concepts that I've laid out for you? If you've had other ideas for a paladin while watching this video, or want to share some unique paladins that you've played, please share them in the comments below. As Hello Acolytes! Welcome to the Cleric Corner. My name is Riker, and here we talk about all things Dungeons & Dragons, tapping into our higher powers to create worlds more unique and stories more impactful. Looking at the Ranger, the Player's Handbook says that they are warriors of the wilderness that specialize in a favored foe, harnessing both nature magic and weapons to aid them. With melee, spells, stealth, survivability, and healing, Rangers is one of the most diverse classes in Dungeons & Dragons, which also gives them great reflavoring capabilities. So what if instead of your regular Ranger, they located creatures through clairvoyance, or even tamed more eldritch type beings. Together, we'll look at different tropes and archetypes that we can explore outside of the norm. So I'll be going over 10 different concepts for your next ranger character to help you hit the mark, or rather, hunter's mark. Starting out, let's look at a ranger that some of you might be familiar with from my Druids Can Be Wizards 2 video, the Clairvoyant Ranger. And so expanding on that idea, rangers that use more of a divination magic, their divination replaces their need to be familiar with nature or tracking. They get small glimpses of the future to tie down their quarry and patiently write out the correct timeline to get to their destinations safely. Through the use of spells like Locate Creature or Find the Path, you know that if you went this direction, you would get to your destination within a specific time or distance. This is your minority report character where you can sense danger before it arrives with your primeval awareness or other spells. And instead of speaking with the beast, you peer into their past and see what they saw. And I do want to give a big shout out to all of you guys who are taking some of these ideas and making them your own. There were a few of you who actually made your own subclasses based on this one mention of this idea in a previous video. And this is why I think that creativity is so important, especially sharing of ideas is so important. Because when new ideas are shared and expanded, fantastic things can happen. But going on, rangers usually have some sort of purpose on why they're traveling or why they're getting from point A to point B. One purpose is to carry messages from city to city. But what if your ranger isn't a messenger for a king or a noble, but a messenger for the souls of the dead? The Crossroad Ranger is an undead courier that uses this folkloric crossroad concept to speak with those from the other side. They can traverse between this realm and the ethereal realm, or they can be a conduit for the voices beyond the grave. Their awareness could be sensing different souls around them, or their summoned beasts are spirits of pets who have passed on. Or you could take on a demon or devilish approach that your purpose is to ferry these souls, carrying the condemned to hell across the river Styx. The beasts you summon are regular animals that you possess with these devils. But the ethereal realm isn't the only realm that rangers are known to traverse. With so many other planes out there, the Horizon Walker Ranger is kind of a catch all to all of these, but I think we can expand that a little bit more. With the Sentinel Ranger, they are gatekeepers and guardians of the material realm. They could be immortals that have watched for decades and decades, taking on magical capabilities of the portal that they guard. They are creatures of that realm personified, or a sentient being that was born out of that plane or even becoming constructs cursed to stand at their watch for eternity, only to be awakened by passing adventurers or other greater cause. And being a guardian of this rip through the multiverse, it begs the question why you're out adventuring and what happens to this portal. A guardian of the Fae could have a layer of bark skin. A guardian of the Shadowfell could have shadowy wisps that move across their skin. Or a guardian of a heaven realm might be able to sprout wings for a time. But you don't have to keep this strictly to portals either. You could be the guardians of nature, or a significant landmark, or the graveyard of some dead god. They are experts at either keeping things in, or keeping things out. 
so get creative. But as the menagerie of beasts and monstrosities that have entered into the material realm from these other planes, it seems like these sentinels can often fail at their jobs, letting these creatures roam a realm that's not their own. So we send a ranger that can capture or tame these beasts, called the Eldritch Tamer. Why limit ourselves to only beasts or dragons in the sense of the Drake Warden Ranger? If rangers are the go-to class for taming monsters or hunting them, it would make sense that we would look to them to interact with a plethora of different types of creatures. And if they're going to be professionals in interdimensional terrains, like the Horizon Walker Ranger, why wouldn't it make sense for them to be also good at taming the creatures within them? Imagine a ranger with a mud method as a companion, or an Abyssal Chicken, or a Boggle, or a Choker. You can open up the monster manual and just be crazy. And I'm not saying that you actually use these stat blocks because that's up to you and the DM, but you can always reflavor what you currently have as a ranger option to these other types of beasts. And I would argue that a lot of people think that the ranger is underpowered, so it wouldn't hurt to just homebrew a little bit. But before we get to the next one, if you think that this video adds value to you and you're enjoying this series or my other content, consider supporting me on Patreon. And with your added support, not only do you get channel perks, but you also help me as a creator grow and develop this channel to make better content for you. There are lots of big things to come, so it just depends on if you want to be a part of it. But getting back to it, with all of the many creatures that you either fight or sucker, your favorite enemy doesn't have to be something that you kill. We could absolutely reflavor it as a favored friend or a favored study. With the expert ranger, they actually idolize their favorite enemy and pursue an audience with them. They could want to study them or advocate for them or help them on the brink of extinction. Extinction. They could help in relocating these creatures or specialize in documenting information about them. It could be a creature that you obsessed about when you were a kid and now you're a professor that teaches about them. Or in an extreme sense, these rangers could idolize or even worship these creatures creating a cult following. You just have to realize that the only real mechanic that the ranger gives you to kill your favorite enemy isn't until like level 20. Even if you're in a campaign that made it to that level, it's a good chance that you multi-class by then or can do so now. So hunt them down to help them, not hurt them. But with favored enemies, there is also favored terrain. And instead of being an expert in a biome because you live there, why not be an expert because you studied there or want to go there? Evelyn O'Connell from the movie The Mummy is an excellent example of the Explorer Ranger. These rangers are academic archeologists or dungeon experts before they even go out into the field. Perhaps they have doubts or they're introverted, but they still have this burning desire to go out there and explore. Also, would it be too much to ask to have dungeons as a favorite? terrain? I feel like that would fix a lot of complaints some people have. But reflavoring your ranger this way, they could easily look more like a scholar or wizard type character, with the origin of their magic not coming from nature, but from the arcane. They might struggle to find funding within their college for these expeditions. Kind of like Milo from the movie Atlantis, where they are whisked away with invested adventurers. They could explore the ruins of the forest, bringing machetes or shovels, or deep sea divers fighting with harpoons and nets. And now even though rangers are described as people who traverse the edges of civilization between city and forest, let's further explore what a city ranger might look like. What if your favorite enemy were the very people that you were left to guard? With the Watchman Ranger, we get to explore the many archetypes of the city bowmen. These rangers could be the ones standing watch at a tower in between cities, setting their towers ablaze at the sight of danger. They are the Jon Snow of your universe, or the forest guard, or the scouts. If you went further into the city, perhaps they are the animal trainer for the law enforcement, training guard dogs, or letter-carrying hawks or pigeons. They could be your average fisherman or farmer, or a huntsman that sells their spoils at the market to feed their family. Or they could be the one assigned to train the Duke's son in the skills of archery. But one thing Thing I do think that is largely unexplored with the ranger is their arsenal. Sure, bows, crossbows, or even dual wielding swords are cool, but in the city and with big walls, you might be looking at much bigger weaponry. The Siege Ranger is in charge of the bigger guns. They are experts in the cannon, catapult, battering ramps, ballistas, trebuchets, and the list goes on. Now I agree that this might take a specific campaign or adventure, but let's say on a nautical campaign where you fight pirates, your ranger might be an expert on all of the cannons on your ship. After all, who else would you choose to be an expert on these ranged weapons other than the ranger? But I would even say have some fun in researching 
searching olden day or medieval weapons that they used in sieges or ranged combat. The weapon called the Trump was an ancient flamethrower that also acted as a shotgun, and a fire hoop was especially effective with hordes of enemies. So what weapon does your ranger use? All I say is that using Conjure Volley spell on a trebuchet or a cannon is not a flavor that you see every day. But on the opposite end of the spectrum, what if you don't need weapons at all? You are a minimalist on the edges of a monk monastery. With the Zen Archer Ranger, we look at concepts like the subclasses Soul Knife Rogue and Psy Warrior Fighter. You use spiritual or psychic energy to create your ammunition. After all, who keeps track of their ammunition anyways, right? If you are, you're a better person than me. But these rangers through meditation, training, and fasting are now one with their bow, even so as to manifest these spectral arrows to aid them. They may even be able to shoot a needle off of a horse with their eyes closed with their feet. It is truly an extension of themselves as they guard the monastery from potential threats. But there are also rangers that are not so zen, and even occasionally brood, and only fight monsters because there's really nothing else better to do. Or if they're bored or poor enough, they even go out and find humans to kill. So in this concept, we look at the Bounty Hunter Ranger, specializing in being a sellsword and finding those who don't want to be found. They are your investigator, even to the point of disguising themselves to get information. They could be paid off by people, or they could be following the will of their deity and tracking people down to pay off their penance. These are also your blood hunters, using blood and elixirs in the art of Hemocraft. Now I know that there is an entire class created by Matthew Mercer for this archetype, but just in case that your DM doesn't allow it, the Ranger is a good trope to fit the bill. Now, I wasn't going to make a video about the Blood Hunter in this series because it is third party, but I've gotten a couple people who have mentioned wanting to see it, so if it's something that you want to see included in this Better Classes series, let me know in the comments below. I myself love the class and would be happy to do it, but I feel like we went over a lot for the Ranger, so I hope that you could take some of these ideas and make the next Ranger that you make your own. Rangers are my second favorite class after all, and I should mention that that being based in nature magic, just like the druid, you could even watch my druid video and apply reflavor a lot of the ideas I had in that one to your next ranger. And if you have other ideas for the ranger and how to reflavor it, add them to the comments below. Wait a second, you have the observant feet. You could probably see me this whole time. Ah, oh, fine, whatever. Let's get along to the video. Mid-maxing little, why do I even try? Hello Acolytes, welcome to the Cleric Corner. My name is Riker, and here we talk about all things Dungeons and Dragons, tapping into our higher powers to create worlds that are more unique and stories that are more impactful. Am I gonna do this whole video in my rogue makeup? Yes, absolutely, because I think I nailed the smoky eye and it needs to be appreciated. But let's get to it. Rogues in the player's handbook can be described as a variety of different skill monkeys, but many choose the route of cunning and sneakiness. Even more, prioritize dexterity over brute strength. But what if your rogue was never sneaky? Or it prioritized strength over dexterity? What would that look like? What other role play or narrative potential does the rogue have that we may or may not have explored just yet. For this Better Classes series, I'm excited to start off with the Rogue for our martial classes. My amazing patrons decided that this one was next, so as we explore the remainder of the classes, if you want to join Patreon and help decide future videos as well as support the channel, you can find the link below. Your support helps me make the best videos I can and prepare for future projects and the growth of the channel. So without further ado, I'm gonna go over 10 different ways to make your rogue unique and fun. These ideas won't change the mechanics at all, but offer a story for a rogue that you may not have had yet. Turning your concept from thieves can't to thieves can. I blame that joke on the lack of parents in my backstory. 
But to begin, let's look at rogues instead of having proficiency or expertise in sleight of hand or stealth. What if your rogues were proficient in religion and history? If you watched the Druids Can Be Wizards 2 video from a couple weeks ago, you might be familiar with the Acolyte Rogue. The rogue is a faithful follower of their god, and in return, their strikes are guided by the hand of God, flavoring their sneak attack as some sort of smite, even. You could even roleplay a Tim disciple that closes his eyes when it attacks a target, but somehow, some way, that dagger still makes its mark. They might think it's weird that their god chose them when they have no magic at all. Their cunning action, uncanny dodge, and evasion could also be reflavored as their god just trying to protect them, giving them a chosen one or plot armor feel. You could even be the phantom rogue and roleplay some angelic helpers, and your thieves can't could have some celestial ties and just be spoken within the members of your church. But if religion isn't your thing, what about botany? Some rogues may deal in poisons and even alchemy. With the botanist rogues, their proficiencies are in survival and in nature. The scout rogue fits this kind of well, but if you wanted to use any rogue, you could reflavor your daggers having a coagulant mixture on them. So when you stab someone with your weapon, the wounds keep bleeding and don't stop explaining the extra damage that they might take. They could even take herbs to increase their focus on the battlefield, like Rhodiola rosea. These are the ones that are obsessed with the natural benefits of plants. Your average essential oils advocate. Perhaps you even scam people with fake oils and potions. Or you could take the healer feat to lean into the herbal healing. A fast hands feature might help you pass out potions. Or you could flavor uncanny dodge as a quick salve that you put on yourself as you suffer a burn from a fireball. But speaking of medicine, what if a rogue is proficient in that? You could go the doctor route, which is a great way, but what if there were other ways that they could be proficient in medicine? Let me introduce you to the mortician rogue. Years of embalming have given you a unique perspective on the weak points of the body. You know how to cause damage, and you know which points hurt the most. You know where to push a needle, a scalpel, or a bone saw to cause the most damage. You know pressure points and nerve points to poke at to cause the enemy to slow down enough for you to dodge. You're used to death, then you even see it as natural. You might even keep around some parts of some previous patrons. Or you might be haunted by those on your embalming table. Perhaps you're on an adventure to figure out why so many have died from a particular cause. But next up, let's switch to proficiency in Arcana. Of course, rogues don't cast magic unless you're an arcane trickster, so how else should we explain Arcana? Well, this rogue also happens to be proficient in performance, and they put on a show to scam people out of their money. The magician rogue uses lights and misdirection to manipulate people to their good side or they're bad if necessary. They can use smoke screens, glitter bombs, or flowers that shoot water to evade enemy attacks. They can use misdirections and distractions to land a fatal blow with the knife hidden in their cane. They could be sword swallowers or knife throwers that work hand in hand with other sword bards. This can even be your very own Sean Spencer from Psych that through elaborate explanations and stories convinces everyone that they saved the day and used powers beyond their capabilities. Now we'll come back to Arcana in a second, but what if your rogue is bad at something that makes a lot of rogues good? Their dexterity. Instead, you trade fast twitch for slow twitch muscles and are proficient in athletics, focusing on strength. This trope I call the brute. It's your average alley thug, security guard, or bouncer. With this rogue, you can even be proficient in intimidation. The great thing about rogues is that they only need finesse weapons in order to get off their sneak attack and you can use your strength modifiers for finesse weapons. Imagine your assassin rogue punching someone out with one hit with their brass knuckles. Your evasion or uncanny dodge can just be you standing in place and taking it like a man, a lot like a barbarian. Not every street dweller is a lean and scrappy rogue that we've come to know. But back to Arcana, let's say that your rogue comes from a wealthy family. No need to steal or sneak, being from money. Or they could be hiding from their money, in which case, go right ahead. But with this concept, they really don't have any street training or street cred in that case, so they turn to other means to get their abilities. The noble rogue enlists the help of a wizard that put wards on them and enchantments on their weapons. Or they could put these minor wards on themselves, being from a pristine school and having a great education. When they sneak attack, 
they magically do extra damage. When they evade, instead, a magical shield appears and takes half the blow. If you did want to be a sneaky class, you could explain those abilities by having some sort of silence enchantment, like the silence spell. This trope may thrive with the mastermind subclass, being educated in a lot of things. But I do recognize that with rogues, dexterity is a lot a part of the charm of the subclass. So being proficient in acrobatics, let's look at the gymnast rogue. Skilled in things like balance beams, trapeze, rock climbing, or parkour. They have these abilities purely for recreation, jumping off buildings for sport. Your flexibility gives you an edge in a fight and of course helps you evade attacks. You're a great Robin character. You're great at quick getaways and getting over tight obstacles. And the thief rogue might even complement some of the parkour abilities. With a few more proficiencies to go over, what if your rogue was especially good at deception or persuasion? They don't have to sneak around, because their silver tongue can get them out of any situation. With the politician rogue, you're very good at swaying the crowd. You can convince people to give you cover or bribe people to get information. They are rogues that you don't really expect, but they always keep a dagger under their cloak because of the nature of their job. There may be many who don't agree how you are running things. You could be stealing money from the population and not picking pockets, but just going around as a tax collector and taking a percentage for your troubles. You could also be a lawyer for similar reasons, knowing the law enough to find loopholes to get you out of every situation. Now we have an interesting one, where we get to explore what a rogue looks like being proficient in animal handling. Imagine your party strolling down a forest path, and out of nowhere, a group of bandits on horseback corner you. You can't run because they're faster and would catch you. Looking back, your party knew that there was something up with that bird that kept following you. The Highwayman Rogue uses animals to their advantage. They can train animals to distract guards or alert them to passersby. They may train hawks to intercept letters from homing pigeons or owls that might have some useful information. They can befriend a guard dog to get into a nobleman's home. Or they can train their own dog to act out a limp and get extra food from those that pity it. Aladdin and Abu come to mind with this trope. Even more, they could be your shifty pet shop owners or their exotic animal traders. But next time you hear horse hooves coming down the street, you might want to get off the road. But with your rogue character, it may not matter what you're proficient in to you. Or you can stick with the very relevant skills of stealth and sleight of hand. But if you did, why not explain those abilities in a unique way as well? With the shadow rogue, your abilities come not from training, but your close encounters from shadows or shades. Perhaps you were on the cusp of turning into a shadow from its strength drain. You pulled out just in time, but somehow retained some ability to slink into shadows. Perhaps your stealth comes from attunement to the Shadowfell in some planar accident. Perhaps you were trained by a shade or something that was very good at stealth, like a Chewinga or Invisible Stalker. But in this way, your stealth comes with a little bit more of a magical nature. But however way you want to flavor rogue and explain their abilities, know that there are many ways to explain their mechanics in a fun way. I just hope that this video helps spur up some imagination and creativity for your next player character or your DM's next NPC. But if you come up with other ideas for the rogue or wish to share your unique rogue that you may be playing now, let me know in the comments below. If you According to the player's handbook, sorcerers get their magic from their bloodline. Latent magic that gives them a natural gift toward magic. They also said that this magic could come from exposure to planar magic, and that the exposure unlocks the magic within. What we're going to do today is alter a little bit of how we view sorcerers. What if their gifts came by will alone, by monsters, or by runes? Let's talk about character concepts to help your sorcerer be unique and your magic meta. Oh, but first I gotta clean the screen, there's something on it. <coughs> oh, sorry. Wild magic surge. Hello Acolytes, welcome to the Cleric Corner. My name is Riker, and here we talk about all things Dungeons and Dragons, 
tapping into our higher powers to create worlds that are more unique and stories that are more impactful. I'll be going over 10 different sorcerer ideas to get the brainstorm going and help your character be just a little bit different. And I think with any character, whether you're a player or you're a DM creating NPC, you want it to be memorable. Make sure to check out the other videos in this series as I've covered a lot of classes before and make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss when I transfer over to Marshall classes. And I'll just take a moment now to thank all of you wonderful people for helping me get to 1000 subscribers by the end of the year. I'll come out with some sort of giveaway in the next coming weeks, so watch out, but let's get to it. As for the first concept, we look at the Deadpool Sorcerer. And I use this name specifically because I think it captures of what I'm trying to go for. Imagine a world full of magic and specifically in your family circle or with your friends, they have all of these amazing abilities and you got stuck with none of them. Or maybe in a long line of sorcerers, you're the first one that doesn't get the magic, but you're the odd one out and you can't live with that. So you pursue unorthodox ways and experimentation to get your magic. And just like Deadpool, these methods might not be the most ethical, but whatever you do, it forces the magic to manifest itself whether or not it was ready. You could also fall into a vat of toxic waste or expose yourself to gamma rays. And through these methods, you eventually get your magic, but it comes at a price. Maybe your skin is disfigured now, or you become more animalistic in nature. But just knowing that forcing yourself upon the weave isn't great when you don't have consent. Another way that your sorcerer could make up for not getting magic at birth is fusing themselves with it. They see the magic of artificers that imbue and infuse magic items with magic, and they watch as they carve specific runes inside them to do so. This sorcerer thinks that if you can imbue items with these runes, you can imbue yourself as well. With the glyph sorcerer, you are the magic item. They go through body alterations, tattoos, or scarring to imbue themselves with this magic. If you don't want to lean into the body harm of it, you can wear clothing with the specific runes stitched into the fabric. But however way you go about it, these sorcerers unlock new spells the more runes that they apply to their bodies. Now, in the magical world, there are many that pursue access to the strongest magic or having the most power. And if there are sorcerers that are born with it through their lineage, why not exploit that factor? And now bear with me on this one. The same way that you breed cats and dogs for specific purposes, the inbred sorcerer gets their magic in a very similar way. This sorcerer is the product of selective breeding through no fault of their own, but in this world specifically, sorcerers are sorcerers on purpose. And just as there sometimes are complications when it comes to selective breeding, their magic could become wild and unpredictable. In the pursuit of making the greatest sorcerer, you could have very unique parentage, like a Janassi and a fairy, or even a tiefling with an Asimar. But now speaking of parentage, we know that in most cases, sorcerers get their magic from their parents, but what if that magic was physical? What if it was passed down from generation to generation and as one gets it, another one loses it? In the case of the heirloom sorcerer, only one generation has this magic at a time. Your magic could be held, felt, given, and taken. It could take the form of a glowing orb that you absorb into your chest that changes your eye color, or a marking on your arm that appears there when your parents give you this magic, disappearing from their arm. Or it could be a stone that's embedded into your skin, magic taking a more crystalline form. But just be careful not to let others know that this magic can be taken, because it's your job to protect it until you find another heir. Now on the topic of heirs, you might be heirs to something even more powerful. I take this next sorcerer idea, the egg, from a short story by Andy Weir by the same name. Now, I won't go over what's in the video, but you can go and check it out yourself. But the premise is that you are not as the world perceives you, or even how you perceive yourself. You are, in fact, a fetus a child form of some unearthly or otherworldly being. You are in this form to experience and learn what you need to to fulfill your cosmic birthright. You could have been born the normal way or just woke up in an egg in the middle of nowhere. You could know this is your destiny or be completely unaware as you give up your memory to be in this form. Either way, your power comes from what you are destined to become. And being out of water could take on other forms as well. Instead of coming from the heavens as some sort of god baby, you could come from the heavens as some extraterrestrial 
ancestral alien race. With the alien sorcerer, your magic also comes from a world beyond. But from your world, magic works very differently. In fact, everyone from there has innate magical capabilities. You are only unique in the standards that are set around you. You are an alien in disguise as you walk an earthly plane. And maybe instead of your magic being arcane in nature, you could be more like a cleric and have your magic be more divine, or a druid have your magic be more nature-based. Again, the rules are different entirely from this other world, so reflavor away. And continuing on with the sci-fi feel, let's talk about a sorcerer who gets their magic from themselves, but not their version of themselves. With the paradox sorcerer, they feed on the magic of the potential self, potential energy of lost choices. They suck their magic from the multiverse and use what could have been to manifest their magic. The Echo Knight fighter is a perfect example of this concept being used. And they could be taking this potential energy either from their future self or choices that they will make, or from their past selves or choices that they didn't make. They could be able to interact with these alternate versions of themselves or be very unaware of the detriment that they are causing in these alternate universes. Because you never know what happens when you take a time stone out of one universe and put it in another one. But looking to the future can either be hopeful or hopeless. And there are many who prefer to wish upon a star for the magic that they want. Now, wishing upon a star, I'm not sure if that's ever come to fruition for you, but for this sorcerer, the wish it has. They could have wished upon a star themselves, or they could have made a wish with a genie, or paid a high-level caster to cast wish. And a fun element of this sorcerer could be the inability to ever cast wish again. And now these sorcerers could have wished for power itself, but I think that would be a little too easy. What I'm saying is that this sorcerer could have wished for a city to be protected, and then they were given a magic to do so. Or they could have wished for evil spirits to leave the woods, and instead they found their home within the sorcerer. Or they just wished to understand people better, so they were given an aberrant mind. So now we get to look at a sorcerer that instead of getting their magic from the wish spell, selective breeding, or their future selves, they get their magic from exposure. And instead of getting their magic from planes or planar magic, they get their magic from exposure to monsters or creatures. Fizzbrand's Treasury of Dragons introduced us to the steeping mechanic where magic items that spend way too long in a dragon's hoard become imbued with magic. A sorcerer that got its power a similar way we'll call the exposed. Now I talk about this concept in my Better Dragons video, so go check that out. But the premise is that by soaking or marinating in this magic long enough, they gain their magical power by proximity. They don't even have to be inside their lair to begin with. They could just be in the region around it. This could work for any creature that has lair actions or regional effects, or you could just homebrew a monster to have them. You could soak power from a Baylor, Storm Giants, or an Astral Dreadnought. But these monsters can be very dangerous, so be careful. And sometimes this magic doesn't come by proximity, but by the attempt that these monsters have on your life. Many people do have near-death experiences, except with the altered sorcerer, they get to take something back with them. This sorcerer was infected by an illithid tadpole, but it failed the ceramophosis? Ceramophosis? Ceramorphosis? Ceramorphosis? Why is that so hard? Ceramophosis? Ceramorphosis? In this instance, they were changed though just enough to inherit some of the mental capabilities. They could have succeeded against a slod tadpole in a similar way, but maybe they were bitten by a vampire or a werewolf, but their body rejected it and instead they absorbed shadowy type magic. This could also be the fallout from a curse, from a hag or a deal from a devil. These instances could have altered your body or your soul in some way, not just your magic. Whether it be the affliction itself or the proximity to death, how you get your magic is up to you. So as you can see, there are many ways that we can look at the sorcerer to make narrative more impactful and make them more interesting. If you have other ideas for the sorcerer, let me know in the comments below. And if Come to me, child. I have the power you seek. I will grant your desires and make your dreams a reality. All I ask in return is a part of you, yourself, your soul worthless on its own, but I will make it great. Or something like that, you know, <laughs> warlocks and all that.
But let's talk about them. In the player's handbook, it says, Warlocks are defined as making a pact with an otherworldly being, which admittedly is one of the most iconic tropes in Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition, but we're gonna go beyond that. Can a warlock be without a patron? Could you be in charge of the pact that you deal? What other ways can we reflavor the warlock to be something a little bit different, a little bit unorthodox? Let's look at some ideas and concepts to make your pact a bigger deal. Welcome to the Cleric Corner. My name is Riker, and here we talk about all things Dungeons and Dragons, tapping into our higher powers to create worlds that are more unique and stories that are more impactful. Don't forget to check out the other classes that I'm doing in this series. Luckily, no one has to sell their soul for these ideas, but remember that they are my own. And if you have a different opinion or do things a little bit different, that's okay. You can either ignore or expand on things to make your worlds and your warlocks the way that you want to. But with the warlock in its bare bones, we see a spellcaster that is limited in spells or magical ability, don't get me wrong, they are a force to be reckoned with, but they don't have the same flexibility as some other spellcasters have. Without being born into magic or having the intelligence perhaps to learn it, they have to look for outside sources to be able to wield it. So let's look at 10 other ways that we can have our warlock get their magic. And instead of you selling your soul to a contract, you're the one making the terms. This warlock I call the Siphon. And these warlocks realize that there are many sources of magic throughout the world, and instead of asking nicely, they take it by force. What if you have an atropal stuck in a demiplane that you keep on your person, siphoning magic from every day as an undead warlock? At least I think it's an atropal. D&D Beyond didn't have a pronunciation guide. But another way is you pump actual demon blood through your veins via an IV, taking on more fiendish warlock capabilities or you manage to trap a hollyphant on your back in a glass tube, and you channel divine magic through it, becoming more of a celestial warlock, almost like a divine battery. But if you feel like trapping monsters is too far down the alignment scale, you can petition the local artificer to make an arcane battery of some sort your patron being some sort of AI that pumps you full of this arcane magic, giving you a certain amount of slots before it needs to charge up again for a while. And this could come from other magic items in a similar way, but the point is your warlock is setting the terms in this relationship. But what if we took that idea and expanded it just a little bit further? Instead of your warlock making a pact with some divine or demonic being, they were that being. And this deity either made their pact with themselves or fell from heaven due to a breach in contract with some other deity. This warlock, the mortal, is a husk or a shell of what it once was. It could have been forcibly pushed out of its pantheon to dwell amongst the mortals on the material plane. This could be a trial or a punishment that it either went willingly or by force, or they were jealous of all the mortals who were living normal lives and just wanted to be a part of them. They could want to retire from their heavenly throne, or they could want to give up their power to some other god that could be better fit for their domain. In the process, they gave up most of their magic, only leaving a fraction of what they had. This deity could come from any other plane. It could be a genie that was tired of immortality, or a devil that made a deal with a wizard and somehow got back its vessel. Another fun element of lore is the Kuatoa, which actually by their sheer belief as a civilization, they create gods. You could be the start of one of these new gods, being born of this imagination. One great thing about warlocks is their connection to divine beings or aberrations, devils, oozes, you name it. It just creates very esoteric story elements. But usually with these stories, they end up in the warlock's patron being killed. In some campaigns, you may have already killed off some of these majestic creatures. But have you ever asked yourself what happens to those warlocks once their patron is killed off. So with the Unchained Warlock, what if someone else beat you to the punch and killed your patron before you could do it? But somehow, some way, you still have retained some of their magic. You may still have inner magical scars that allows you to still channel the weave. Or as its patron, maybe some of its soul still locked onto you. Kind of like Voldemort and Harry Potter, I guess. Or perhaps you carry a piece of this patron on your person, which you channel your magic through. But now free of the ever-watching eye of your patron, you ask yourself, 
What do you do? Is whoever is responsible for killing your patron now after you? Or better yet, do you want to revive your patron so that you can return it to its former glory? Could be a very interesting take on the Stockholm Syndrome. In the case of this warlock, the events was largely out of your control, but you still chose your pact to begin with. But what if your pact was not your choice and someone else made it for you? Let me introduce the Choiceless Warlock. And this could come from a longtime friend who sacrificed your soul to save themselves, plunging you into the servitude of an ancient kraken. This could also come from a grandmother or a grandfather who gave up their daughter's third child to an archfey in order to save their farm. Or picture this, you're an acolyte of some sort of god and they sell your soul off to somebody else to settle a debt. Or you could wake up from death and have no idea why, but someone demands that you owe them. Another instance is that you could be mind controlled into possibly making a deal with a lich. This could also be two deities or two greater beings who are fighting over your soul because you're the chosen one for both faiths. Whatever case, your agency is thrown aside for the greater good. But speaking of agency, you all can exercise your free will to smash that like button and subscribe to the channel. I know, I know, not my best segue. I will never sell my soul for views, but if you think that this video adds value, it helps appease the algorithm gods. Ooh, that would actually be a good subclass. Pact of the algorithm. That would be a really tempting deal. Nope, this cleric isn't multi-classing. But if we do reach a thousand subscribers by the end of the year, I'll probably do some sort of big giveaway, possibly a, a book of choice or something. We'll see. But going on, I think that one of the most defining features of a warlock is their relationship, a union with some other being. So with the Bond Warlock, what if your magic came strictly from that, the union? Not channeling the creature's magic at all, but the magic from the Bond itself. This would be my second Harry Potter reference today, but kind of like Lily when she protected Harry Potter at the beginning of it all. The power of friendship if you will. And I see this actually doing really well with the Pact of the Chain Warlock, where they get to keep a pet or something. Becoming so close to this creature that the love that you have for one another blossoms in eldritch magic. It could be fey magic from a fey spirit that you summon, or a draconic magic from a pseudo dragon, or you could take one from the golden compass and have your companion either share your soul or your soul be contained in the creature. I could also see this happening with a loved one being trapped in a sentient weapon. And as you wield the sword, you gain some sort of magical capabilities from whoever put them there. Or the Pact of the Talisman fits perfectly as you literally channel a relationship with someone else. The pact could be in the form of that connection or the promise that you made with the other person. An example of this would be Opal from Critical Role. There could be other Eldritch things going on, but mainly the feature of the twin that she had her pact with. Another way to look at your patron relationship is giving up control completely. You are only the vessel for something else to take the spotlight and cast your spells as you take a back seat in your mind. With the shared soul warlock, you become very similar to Split in the movie with alternate personalities. Or it could be like Yu-Gi-Oh where you and your patron have full trust in one another a spirit that shares your vessel and takes over when the going gets tough. This warlock could also be called the symbiote if you wanted to go more of a venom flavor, with which you could look at the ooze in a lithid tadpole or some astral spirit. But with other warlocks, these relationships are far less quality and more quantity. The relationships that they form are more frequent and fleeting. Instead of making a pact with one creature, it makes pacts with many. Here we meet the Contractor Warlock. Imagine someone who is summoning devils periodically and making deals with them, but making sure to write up the contract in such a way that it's a smaller deal and they don't sell their soul. Instead, they do smaller tasks for temporary power, and once that magic is used up, then they will summon another devil. Making these packs could be the result of just wanting a thrill. It could be business opportunities, or it could just be skirting the system that most warlocks don't avoid. They could source their magic just from the last contract that they made, or they could be a middleman and make contracts for their patron, meaning that they get to keep their soul and their magic, but they bring others to their demise. And I know that I keep referencing like devils and demons, but these could literally be any planar being ever. But let's think what if instead your patron is some sort of planar being, 
but something more familiar, something more on the material realm. What if a business or organization offers you this power to be a part of their system? With a fitting name, in my opinion, we have the Pyramid Warlock. You sign up with the promise of success. You may be tasked to go out and recruit others into this scheme, or you could go on different adventures by request, like a adventurer's guild. And honestly, you could still make this like a legit MLM or network marketing program. Or the group could promise you these amazing abilities, but the more that you're in the program, you realize that the only people who benefit are the people at the top. You never seem to get above two spell slots. What's that about? But this could also be another organization that gives out magic in return of service. You could sign up with the military as a patron or sign a blood contract for a timeshare. But speaking of success, some people have to work for it and other people are just born into it. Or at least some people don't have to fight as hard to get certain things. Let's talk about the rich kid warlock. This warlock doesn't really have to work for anything because what they have is given to them as an inheritance. Their patron could actually be a parental figure where they get their magic from daddy through some sort of arcane transference. Or the sugar daddy could not be genetic, of course, that's an option. But these parental figures could be either sorcerers or wizards, or they could be rich enough to buy off another sorcerer or wizard. And with enough gold, this other wizard marks you with some sort of symbol and you start to channel their magic. If devils can write up a contract, why can't a wizard? And you could actually mix this with the Siphon Warlock where your parents pay somebody else to go and trap a holly fence so that you can get your magic from. But whatever this looks like, this warlock spends little effort learning magic because mommy and daddy will take care of it. But speaking of magic that's not their own, let's talk about the insatiable hunger of the Absorber Warlock. With no one to offer them magic, they learn to go out and take it from others. They learn to steal magic from others by touch, much like Peter Petrelli from the Heroes TV show. Or if we look at Siler from the same show, they could get their power from killing and inspecting brains. There's also a media trope called digestive assimilation, where you get its power by consuming the source. Examples of this would be the Wendigo or Kirby. And if humanoids are too much in your campaign, you can get your power by periodically consuming aberrations or monstrosities. It could be very vampiric in nature where you soak up their stagnant magic after they're dead until your next charge up. This could also be really cool if your DM lets you change your patron subclass like as you consume different things. And another way to look at it is what if you were a changeling and by changing into certain people, you can channel just a portion of the magic that they have. But whatever way you look at it, warlocks are full of narrative gold in storytelling. In many cases, it doesn't matter to the warlock how they get their magic as long as they have it. And to others, it's for the greater good. This is a public service announcement. There is a contagion around the world that has taken lives of many humanoids. Shops have closed their doors to not let adventurers endanger them with their presence. The old and less dexterous of the community have particularly been affected. Please, do all you can to protect your family and stay at home. And to all the wizards out there who are carriers of this plague, I beg of you, Fireball is not the only answer. <laughs> think I can wear this outside as a mask? Yeah, I didn't think so. Oh, let me fix my hair. Also, turtlenecks are still a thing, right? Hello, Acolytes. Welcome to the Claret Corner. My name is Riker, and here we talk about all things Dungeons and Dragons, tapping into our higher powers to create worlds that are more unique and stories that are more impactful. In the world of Dungeons and Dragons, wizards have a common trope of being scholars, dedicating years of study in their far off arcane towers. What we're going to do today is brainstorm a little bit of how we can go outside of that trope and make wizards a little bit different. So with this brainstorming sessions, it's important to know that fantasy is fantasy and you can make it whatever you want. So I'll be going over 10 different ways to make your wizard unique and refreshing in your next character build. And then if you stay to the end, I will have a bonus reflavoring tip for your wizard to make it a little bit more dynamic. So knowing mechanics wise that wizards focus on intelligence, we will keep that in mind going forward. But let's first go to the far realm, a plane of existence that if you ever set foot on, it turns your mind to mush. In this case, that's exactly what happened to our wizard. Its intelligence still bested by the mind of Cthulhu. With the mad wizard, 
Your abilities are imprinted on your brain like a scar. They had no education beforehand like regular wizards, but the experience left an eldritch download into their brains that left it torn apart. But it doesn't have to be just Cthulhu. It could be experimentation from mind flayers or enthrallment from an aboleth. Or they could be slave to a kraken or spend years adrift in the astral sea. But either way, their brain is bombarded with magical equations that imprint on it so that their subconscious manifests to their detriment. These wizards, who arguably should be in a psych ward, are the ones that wake up with chalk equations drawn around them in their sleep. However, next we can look at a wizard who is similarly afflicted mentally, but it was no fault of their own or by another person. The prodigy wizard gets their magic from the super intelligence that they were born with. Photographic memory, perfect recall, and an impossibly high IQ. Perhaps in your world, only individuals with this level of IQ are the ones that can attain wizard levels. Some examples of the prodigy, I think of the good doctor or rain man, whose talents come from specifically where their mental state is at. Now, at your table, you may want to be careful of romanticizing mental illnesses, but those of you who struggle with your own and wish to see it as more of a gift, this would be a perfect way to apply it in-game. Now, for some, intelligence does not come naturally. They may have struggled in school their entire life, so they've resorted to other means in order to obtain it. With the implant wizard, they've resorted to other means like magic items, injections, or transmutations to alter their smarts. This works well in a future setting where you can have some sort of robotic modification on your head that increases your brain power. In a regular medieval D&D setting, this can be just as well done with the item Headband of Intellect. In the movie Project Power, they have to take special pills that manifest their power. In a similar way, your wizard can concoct these pills or an EpiPen-like injection to give you the boost that you need. But what is intelligence anyways? What is mathematics? What is arcana? If it took a form, like intelligence personified, what would that look like? This wizard has asked the same thing and found something incredible. And I'm not talking about the god of knowledge or anything, but literally the equations beneath the gods that make the universe tick. With the clockwork wizard, they tap into this manifestation of intelligence. You could say it's the weave, but I think the gods created the weave from something much more intimate. One example I found was Alioth from the Loki series, a being born from the void at the end of time. You could also flavor this kind of like the bard, where a poem or a soliloquy on paper has has power. So similarly, equations on a piece of paper as well as a lecture might have the same exact power. There is also a plane entirely made up of mathematics and order called Mechanus, where your wizard could get their powers from. But speaking of lectures, let's continue on that idea. Again, normally wizards get their magic from studying magic, but what if they got their magic from studying anything? from studying itself, the pursuit of knowledge, if you will. With the Professor Wizard, they don't focus on schools of magic like abjuration, transmutation, or necromancy. They focus instead on the schools of history, art, drama. And they might not be the ones on stage with the bards in the drama club, but they are the ones that study entertainment theory and entertainment psychology. This is also your PE teacher with their incredible study on the human anatomy can cast spells like Tensor's Transformation or Enlarge Reduce. They could be an atheist dedicated to religious studies or a cook that their intelligence about food gives them magic, but the magic coming from their intelligence based on the subject that they pursued, not the subject of magic itself. Now, now, to preface this next one, I actually have to get something off of my chest. Imagine a magical world, a high fantasy, where there are colleges that teach people magic. In fact, they dot the land and many people get a formal education. And while wizards in class are learning the mold earth cantrip, there are dwarves in nearby mine who are shoveling away. Or the wizards learning prestidigitation while their maid at home is cleaning by hand. What's also weird to me is that the average farmer doesn't know druid craft, just a basic cantrip. All of these cantrips could be considered essential in their jobs at hand. And I should mention that a lot of races without getting levels in anything get cantrips by themselves. Even a variant human has first level spells before they even pick a class. Now, this of course, depends on your world and your campaign and the level of magic inside of it, but I say in a high magic setting, every educated person 
has at least one level in Wizard. So with the Educated Wizard, miners have cantrips like Light and Mold Earth. They also have Earth Tremors to test stability, or Tensor's Floating Disc to carry out loads of rock. A farmer has a spell Find Familiar to get a cattle dog to help with his animals, or Burning Hands to help refresh the crops at the end of a harvest. You could also have a psychologist learn enchantment spells to help with the mentally ill, or a lawyer learning Zone of Truth to help in court cases. A base level of education would be the most common way of getting magic in this world. And to explain the other spells that might be on your wizard list, the miner might know Shape Water because they needed to take the prerequisite class, Elementalism 101, before they could take the classes that they really wanted to take. And the great thing about being educated is that your wizard could fulfill a lot of different purposes as well. Want a wizard that's more like a rogue? A fighter? A ranger? Luckily, with an assortment of spells, you can really reflavor your wizard to be a lot of different things. I'd imagine that the Thieves Guild would be very interested in having an illusionist wizard on their payroll, or the military would be very interested in providing their military with Bladesinger levels. Not to mention that ranged spells would be essential for law enforcement. Add some divination and conjuration levels, and now you have a unique ranger. Wizards could also even fulfill the role of death, arcana, knowledge, order, and war clerics. In my opinion, domains that isn't about life really shouldn't have healing spells anyways, but that's a topic for another video. And before you start commenting, oh, you should then just be a ranger. Yes, I get it, but what if I wanted ninth level spells? And again, with fantasy, you can define classes however you'd like. And so now that we've talked about wizards that are really good at everything, let's talk about a wizard that's really not good at anything. The cheat wizard isn't as intelligent as far as IQ goes, but they get all A's by copying off of their friend's homework and working the system. They are of the attitude that if Google exists, why should we study? Google, of course, in this case being spell scrolls and items. This is also the wizard that maybe looks like they're casting a spell, but instead has a scroll written on the inside of their wrist that they're cheating off of. You could also reflavor this in a way that compliments you paying for the spells that you know. Instead, you can pay money to some sort of entity that places the spell in your mind. Kind of like a warlock, but you don't have to sell your soul for it, but just the right amount of coin, and it is a spell learned. Another big element of wizard is their focus on components. What if you lean hard into that concept and instead of getting your magic from your intellect, you get magic from deriving it from a plant called the Dragon's Breath Orchid or a Troll's Left Thumb. With the component wizard, you literally draw magic from these components, leaving it a dry gray husk. You cast a spell and you leave a circle of dead grass in your wake. You could use your wizard gold to buy components instead of paper for your spells. Perhaps Perhaps instead of bat guano, you have to go and get some sort of demon poop to cast fireball. But this wizard's specifically fun because you get to play around with components and what you draw magic from. Now, spells in and of themselves are a powerful force. They swap life and death, they stop time, they reshape the land, and so much more. In some cases, spells are so powerful that they gain sentience themselves. Now, this idea is kinda out there, but I want to introduce to you the Spell Wizard. And they are exactly that, a spell. In D&D 5th edition, we actually have monster stat blocks that are these sentient spells, including Living Burning Hands, Living Lightning Bolt, Living Cloud Kill, Living Unseen Servant, which obviously I couldn't find a picture for. Now, I'm not saying that you should be these spells in specific, but you can pick a spell and go crazy with it. You could be the personification of shape water or the personification of a school of magic itself. You could be the raw representation of abjuration or evocation. It could be a former wizard that through experimentation trapped its sentience within this spell. In my recent Unearthed Arcana video, I actually go over a plasmoid race and this would be perfect to reflavor into. But speaking of sentient spells, what if magic overall was sentient? What if it learned and grew just as you did? And in the process of experimenting with it, you were infected by it, consumed by it. A recent example of the infected wizard would be Victor from the TV show Arcane. Spoiler warning, so if you haven't seen the show, skip ahead a few beats. You could argue that he was an artificer, but later in the TV show, he pushed the limits a little too far. And the Hextech magic that they were experimenting with 
changed and infected his body. Now, I don't think that we've seen the full consequences of that, but I'm excited to see it. Also, that show is incredible and I've been obsessing over it for the past week. But what if your wizard was another class entirely or just a commoner, but they got a little too close to raw magic and became one with it? And let's say if the magic wasn't expended on a daily basis, they would slowly be more and more consumed by it, slowly pulling you into the weave itself. Now, for those of you who stayed this long, thank you, and here is the bonus tip. As far as wizard spell books go, they actually don't need to be just paper. They could be seashells, bones, jewelry, embroidered clothing, carving glyphs on different stones, motes of possibility, or even an assortment of succulents. You could even store all of them in a single orb or crystal and there's so much more. But whatever you go for, just remember, don't let the common tropes of any class or subclass encroach on your creativity to play the character that you want. And if by watching this video, you thought of other ways that you could reflavor the wizard in a unique way, please let me know in the comments below. I'd love to hear it. If you thought the ah! oh, ah, I'm here, I'm ready, let's go. Shh, dude. What are you doing? What, what am I doing? What are you doing? You said that this was going to be a bloodbath. What? No. I said mud bath. M M M mud, mud, mud bath. Got any more cucumbers? Yeah. Get the blood flowing. Yeah. That's... <laughs> Stupid. Hello, Acolytes! Welcome to the Cleric Corner. My name is Riker, and here we talk about all things Dungeons & Dragons, tapping into our higher powers to create worlds more unique and stories more impactful. According to the homebrew class by Matthew Mercer, the Blood Hunter is one that practices magic and curses through blood. And with this life essence, they sacrifice just a bit of themselves to rid the world of monsters and fiends. However, if you're familiar with this channel, we have to ask ourselves, what if we reflavor the Blood Hunter into something entirely new? What if we subverted it from the edgy god that it is to something more of a pacifist? Or instead of influencing blood, you're influencing souls. It is your right, no, Crimson right, to create the unique character that you want that'll fit your adventure and your story. So here are 10 dark augmentations for your next Blood Hunter character concept. Starting with a little clerical flavor, let's look at the Flagellator Blood Hunter. In some religions during the late Middle Ages, people who practiced religion would often whip themselves out of punishment for sins. This process called flagellation was a form of worship to their god. So with your blood hunter in this case, you wouldn't be hurting yourself to evoke blood magic. You would whip yourself in order to call upon your god's magic. Your god requiring a sacrifice or some sort of penance in order to channel it. This god may be easily an evil god or even a demon or devil that requires it. But this is also your Van Helsing character which carries a cross and knows what power comes from it. And this is exactly why I love the Blood Hunter so much. Because it introduces a gothic horror that in my opinion is just not not well represented in D&D 5e. With a few exceptions, this class covers a lot as far as werewolves and vampires. Working on a Frankenstein subclass myself, but there's one other that we can take a look at. With the Jekyll and Hyde Bloodhunter, your pain comes from the transformation. Bloodhunters are often known to fight fire with fire as often they become monsters themselves in the process of fighting other monsters. Jekyll is a real life example of this struggle with the monster within. When you activate your rights or the the damage that you imbue into your swords, you actually allow Mr. Hyde to take over a little bit, causing psychic damage or physical damage as your body expands. You further allow this monster to take over as you continue to amplify your blood curses. Your roleplay is key in this instance as you have to ask yourself, how far would you go? Perhaps over the course of the campaign, you actually gain greater control over this monster, but it's represented in the greater and increasing damage dice when you invoke your curses. But this transformation could be as small as what you experience with the mutant subclass, or you could even reflavor the lichen subclass to be more of a monstrous form 
like what you would see in the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen movie. And also remember that lycanthropy doesn't always have to be werewolves. You could be were tigers, you could be were octopuses, or even were zebras. But another dark archetype that we can lean into would be witchcraft, witchers, and witches. With the voodoo blood hunter, you do not control other creatures by their blood, but by their souls. You curse a creature with a connection with a doll that you hold in your hands, and it moves or doesn't move depending on how you manipulate the doll. But this is also your occult, where your supernatural or spiritualistic beliefs help you in your influence over souls. You are in touch with the paranormal with a traveler size Ouija board, or use tarot cards to influence directly the near future of the souls that you do it on. Or in a simpler way, you can have a natural influence or a familiarity over these souls because of a near death experience that you've had, with you being in touch with the Shadowfell or some other afterlife after the event. But whatever you choose, you can easily reflavor the pain that you feel through your soul corrupting, either slowly deteriorating, slowly deteriorate, I have such a hard time with that word. Either your soul deteriorating over time or you pulling some of your essence in order to influence someone else's. Thank you. After a while, who knows what it will do to your soul in the long term, possibly finishing with your body being an empty vessel or a hollow one. But to further reflavor and subvert what the blood hunter might be, let's look at the Bender blood hunter. Because I'm sure many of you have watched or even tried to implement Avatar The Last Airbender into your D&D game. The blood hunter provides specifically a great basis for the water bender and by association, the blood bender. You could even take some levels in monk or get the shape water canter through like a magic initiate. But now it isn't dark blood magic, but just bending the water within the blood. You could be a water tribe bender from the poles of Icewind Dale, or you could be a water bender from the swamps of Saltmarsh, a swashbuckler pirate or undersea triton folk. But if you're really interested in playing Avatar The Last Airbender at your table, I do have a little bird that told me that there was a role-playing system that was being created on Kickstarter, so I'll link that in the description, because oh boy, would that be fun. But what if instead of soul magic or water bending, instead your ability to influence others comes from the school of enchantment? With the Beguiler Bloodhunter, we're taking a look at the charming magic of vampires, succubi, sirens, or even bards. Silver tongues and alluring music that pulls the focus and self-control of those that you focus on, leaving them open to attacks or unable to move. Perhaps you even bring in an instrument to really lean into the bardic archetype. And to be honest, the bard was the last class that I was expecting to pull archetypes from, but here we are. Perfect to subvert the edge lordliness to something more of an annoying positivity. Imbue your instruments with right damage or mark a creature with a brand of the one-man audience. But of similar origin to a character that might come from vampires or sirens, what if a character came from Abolus? or Mind Flayers, trading charming magic for brainwashing with the Mind Controller Blood Hunter. They have telepathic powers and send messages to the brain, making suggestions or manipulating ideas to either make them hesitate or obey commands. This might even include like hypnosis or mind control gadgets. This also ties in well with the Rite of Oracle with psychic damage. And normally you get this damage type at a later level, but I think that it wouldn't be too inappropriate to get it at an earlier level. Especially if it helps a character concept, simply changing a damage type really isn't all that game breaking. In fact, I encourage you to work with your DM to find new damage types that might be fun and dynamic. Acid, poison, or even just extra bludgeoning or piercing damage from the weapon you choose. But if you've liked what I talked about so far, consider liking the video. It is honestly the best way to let me know that this is the type of content that you like and I should continue to create it. In fact, now that we've covered every class in the Better Classes series, and thank you by the way, but now there is a bunch of new and interesting things that I want to experiment on that I need your help and your input on in the coming weeks. Maybe I do a Better Classes part two, or focus on reflavoring the races next, or deep dives into flavor ideas for specific settings like Ravenloft, or something else new and exciting. So subscribe to the channel and be a part of the next new flavor of YouTube videos. The next Bloodhunter reskin that we're gonna look at is a fun one because they are allergic to magic. With the Glass Cannon Bloodhunter, magic, 
actually hurts you. Perhaps you are cursed, having done wrong with magic so many years previously, or are just punished by some unknown source or deity when you do so. Perhaps it's Mistra herself, the god of magic, that's doing this. Perhaps it's a virus or a magical infection that tarnishes your magic and causes the pain. Or the effects are more psychological, where you're a pacifist and you take psychic damage every time that you cast a spell or hurt others that go against that belief. Ah, there's that guilt damage again. Or perhaps you're a serial empath and you actually experience the hurt that you inflict on other people. Or going crazy, you're from an entirely different universe where taking damage from magic is normal. However, in contrast, let's look at one who fully embraces this affliction and even tries to place it on others. The Hexblood Hunter is a cursed creature that can take that curse and extend it to other people. This hurts you in the process, but your body is a little bit more accustomed to it. The pain that others feel when you place it on them is more punishing and paralyzing. It could be one curse, or you could have taken on many curses over the years. Years of pain from lost loved ones, lost battles, or wrong choices. You have learned to push this pain onto other people so that they may be overwhelmed by it as well. And if I can be so unorthodox, kind of like a reverse Jesus, but this could even be similar to my diseased monk concept in my better monk video that you can check out. So being this disease or sickness inside of you that you, again, push out to other people and thereby they experience it. But perhaps this curse is just bad luck. And you've been able to manipulate that luck with the Jinx Blood Hunter. In contrast with the luck of halflings, you can push bad luck over the battlefield to influence your enemies. This may leave room for a lot of fun narrative and improv at your table. But what if you reflavor the blood curse of binding is just bad luck when the enemy gets their foot stuck on a rock on the battlefield and reduces their movement to zero. Or the blood curse of bloated agony was just them forgetting to stretch before the fight and they developed a cramp on their back. Have fun with playing with the environment and don't be afraid to be silly with it. But of course, almost forgot, as you push out that bad luck, you also take a little bit of bad luck in the form of damage. And of course, magic can come from so many different forms, so let's look at another school of magic. The Transmuter Blood Hunter focuses on, you guessed it, transmutation. Their weapon is a stick before they transmute it into a great steel flaming sword. They transmute the ground into sand to reduce their enemy's speed to zero. You can transmute soft spots on the enemy's armor. You can transform yourself into a ghostly form, an animal form, or a mutant form depending on the subclass that you choose. Warping reality in this case and this much does come at a price with your body. So the damage you're taking is the transmutive energy being translated into warping your bones. Or your skin also temporarily turns into fire as you summon your swords. But even though this is a homebrew class that opened up so many opportunities as far as roleplay and characters in and of itself, we can still think of multiple ways to reflavor and find new archetypes to play with. And I hope that not only with the Blood Hunter, but other classes that you might have previously not been too excited to play with, you are now excited about playing with the mechanics under a completely new idea. If you yourself have found other ways to reflavor the Blood Hunter, please let me know in the comments below and check out the rest